Good morning, good morning, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's so good to see each and every one of your smiling faces. We are excited because today is a special day. This is the seventh day of the week. That means this is the Sabbath, but not only is it the Sabbath, we have an opportunity here at the Oakwood University Church to spend time reflecting on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ through the form and, the, and through the communion service. So we're going to have a great time. We're going to study the Sabbath school lesson. We're going to see God do great things. But before we get started, let's bow our heads and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for one more opportunity to come before your presence. Lord, we're opening up the Word. This, the Sabbath, we're looking at the book of Genesis. And so guide us, give us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding as we examine your relationship with Abraham, his wife, Sarah, and the rest of um, the patriarch's family. Guide us, give us wisdom in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. All right, so I'm glad that you are here, and I have a couple of announcements before we get started. Now, if you enjoy Sabbath School, raise your hand. If you enjoy Sabbath School, raise your hand. Well, I have great news for each and every one of you. Next week, we're going to extend our Sabbath School time. In fact, we're going to start at 1015. So if you come next week at 1030, we'll be already a third of the way through the lesson study. So we want to make sure that you are here and ready to go. We're doing this in conjunction with we're reopening Oak Town, and that is a good thing. So we're going to have a children's Sabbath school for our young people. Uh, beginners will be in my, to my right, your left. Those are here in the Huntsville area. And then the other children, 4 to 11, will be in the Family Life Center gymnasium. So we want to make sure that we're here. We're here on time. We're going to start at 1015. So be mindful of that. Now, last week we were um, in the Von Braun with the Oakwood University with their, Sabbath, with their graduation. We we're excited about that. But this week we're jumping back in the book of Genesis. What book did I say? All right. So if you have a Bible or if you have a pen or a piece of paper, we want to make sure that you t jump on with us. We're looking at God's covenant with Abraham. God's covenant with Abraham. And one of the things that we're going to identify as we're looking through chapters 15, 16, 17, and 18 is that God saves people with issues. Everybody say issues. If, so if, if you have issues, God can save you. Now, now that's good news for me. You may not have issues, but when I read this, I was like, man, there's a whole lot of crazy people that God is in the process of saving. And, and that was okay because I got a little crazy in me, and believe it or not, you have a little crazy in you. And God does the work of saving people. He perfects, perfects us and prepares us for a prepared place. And we're going to examine that as we look through the book of Genesis chapter 15. We are going to start looking at God's mercy in Genesis chapter 15. And verse number two, this was the anchor text for this lesson on Abraham. Genesis chapter 15 and verse number two, and the word of God says, but Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me seeing I go childless and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus? Abraham asked God, what are you going to do because you made me a promise, but it has not been fulfilled yet? We find out in Genesis chapter 15 that we come to a crucial moment where God formalizes his covenant with Abraham. This, what the Bible scholars call this Abrahamic covenant, is the second covenant in the book of Genesis. The first covenant God made with Abraham, and he promised me with Noah, and God promised he would not flood the what again? He would not flood the earth again. That's correct. And here God makes a covenant with, with Abraham and reminds him that this covenant is not just about Abraham and his family. In fact, one of the promises God said that through you, all nations of the world will be blessed. And it's important for us to understand what God was trying to do is that in God saving us and God working in us, it is designed so that we can be a blessing to others. All right, let me say that one more time that every blessing God gives to you is designed so that you can use it and in turn be a blessing to someone else. And we're going to see this universal nature of the covenant that God is going to do, but we're going to see this through the story and the life of Abraham. Now, my challenge is, as we look through the story, God gave Abraham a promise. First of all, God, told, God called Abraham to get, leave his family, his kindred, all his people, 
And he says, go to a place that I'm going to show you. Abraham was minding his own business. In fact, his plan was to go to the city of Canaan, but his family stopped in Ur, was coming to, to Ur, and dwelt there. Haran, excuse me, and dwelt there. But the Bible says something interesting. Abraham was minding his business, and God said, I'm going to do something special. It's almost as if, Brother Ross, he got him excited, as if I was saying, I'm going to go and take you out and play golf, and I'm going to beat you. And I can imagine you are so excited about this whooping I'm going to give him. That's my friend. I, can, I tease him all the time. But so excited about this experience. And then God makes Abraham do the hardest thing in the world. He calls him to move says, I'm going to be with you. And then he says, nothing. How do you follow a God who will move in your life without making reservations, will not ask what's on your calendar. It says, move everything off your calendar. And then the Bible says, he told him this great promise, I'm going to give you a son. And then, nothing? For the child that's preparing for eternity, one of the hardest lessons in our Christian experience is waiting on the timing of God. Like it's one thing when you are excited about what God is going to do and God moves the next day, but what happens when that day turns to weeks? Those weeks turn to months. Those, that deal that you just knew was going to be yours, it gets extended. And now you're trying to figure out, God, what in the world are you doing? Notice what God told him. In verse 15, verses 2 and 4, it says, And Abram said to God, Lord, what will you give me, seeing I go childless? And then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, the one born in my house is my heir. Behold, verse 4 says, The word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, talking about his servant Eleazar, but one shall come from your own body, shall be your heir. Now, I'm well in my 40s, and there's no way in the world, no money that anybody can give me for me to go back to, 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 to feeding kids early in the morning, having them wake up trying to change diapers. I, I, Brother Pullins, I just couldn't do it. But for Abraham, he was excited about the promise that at 70, 80, and almost 90 years old, that God's going to finally give him a son, and that's some real faith. <laughs> Can you imagine, Brother Dent, getting, feeding bottles at four in the morning? <laughs> Try, can, can you imagine taking your kids to Sabbath school? They say, oh, that's your grandbaby. No, this is my baby. <laughs> I mean, how many of us want to have baby showers at this age? But Abraham said, I'm believing for God to do it. And God said, I'm going to do it from your own body. And here's the challenge when it comes to the promises of God. Not only is it a challenge to wait, the challenge is not to step in and help God. Let me say that one more time. One of the challenges that come in, in, in waiting on God is saying, God, you need a little bit of assistance, and let me just help you out the way, help you up just a little bit. And we find that Sarah, Abraham's wife, did this same thing. In, in this context, this, 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 this idea that Sarah said, she said, man, you know what? God is taking a little too long, and so I'm going to help him out. And so she does this thing that I, I don't know any woman in their right mind that would, would do this type of thing. But here in the Bible, remember we said earlier that God saves people with issues. Sarah's issue was waiting on God. And so she said, I'm going to help God. And what we'll do, because it's culturally okay, I will call Hagar my servant. And I'll give her to you, Abraham. And together you can help God. And together we can have a child. Family, one of the worst things we can do is help God help us. 
No matter how fun it may be, no matter how exciting it may be, any time we go outside the will and the way of God, it would always end up in problems. Notice what the lesson brought. It says, in the religion of ancient Egyptians, for instance, judgment was evaluated on the basis of counting one's human works of righteousness against the righteousness of the goddess Matt, excuse me, who represented the divine righteousness. In short, you had to earn your salvation. During this time period, Abraham was under the cultural uh, norm that it was okay to try to work for what the deity promises us. God was creating a different type of people, a people that trusted him no matter what. And so God asked Abraham to make this major sacrifice, and Abraham does that. And again, the Bible, the lesson, lesson brings out, years later, God still does not give Abraham a child. So Sarah, feeling hopeless, takes the initiative and urges him to resort to a common practice of the time of the Near East, take a surrogate. Hagar, Sarah's servant, is appointed for this service. And notice, family, the system worked. It's almost as if Abraham just walked into the room and Hagar automatically got pregnant. <laughs> The idea that all we have to do, this, this was it, it was this easy, we could do this in and of ourselves. And here's the challenge when we're trying to save ourselves. It will seem like everything works out just fine. For the first few minutes. I mean, you guys remember Eve. Eve didn't surely die, did she? No, she didn't immediately die. So she thought maybe God made a mistake. And here's the challenge. When we examine God's promises based on our senses, we will always be right for a brief second and ultimately be eternally wrong. Hagar got pregnant. The human strategy that seemed more efficient than God's promises brought a child, but it was not the child that was promised by God. Even though sometimes our plans work fast, they will not work for long. When we try to usurp the will and the plan of God, we always find ourselves in trouble. Notice the lesson brings out the immediate reward of human work outside of the will of God always leads to future troubles. I can imagine if we took a poll of all the individuals here, the scars that we, hear, we, we bear, emotional and otherwise, have come from going outside the will of God and trying to help God do what we want him to do when we want him to do it. And notice what happens with Sarah. When we operate outside the will of God, our, 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 our mental faculties become discombobulated. We sometimes feel that what's right is wrong and what's wrong is right. And we find this very evident in how Sarah responds to the mistake that she initiated. The Bible says in Exodus, excuse me, Genesis chapter 17, verses 5 and 6, Sarah said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong that I am suffering. Now, just a few verses before, she said, Abraham, baby, if you love me, I want you to go take Hagar. I want you to have a child, and we will do and live the way God always wanted us to live. And just a few verses later, the Bible says, it's all your fault. What was once a happy marriage, what was once individuals that were willing to go anywhere and do anything for each other, all of a sudden, dissension happens when she chose to go outside the will of God. But notice the Bible goes on to say, I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord's judge between me, and now she's trying to put God in it. <laughs> May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abraham said. Do with her whatever you think best. Notice the Bible says, then Sarah mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. When we go outside of the will of God, we have a tendency to place blame where it does not belong. When we do our own thing, we have a tendency to, to, to put blame on everyone else except say, man, you know what, I was in the wrong. And what makes matters even worse, not just Abraham had his wife and his wife called, let's have Hagar, not only did Hagar get pregnant, not, did, not just Sarah blame Abraham and Hagar, but the Bible says that God, you know, this, Brother Poulos, this messed me up. 
God, in the midst of all of this family confusion and mess, still trying to save the family. I mean, think about this. These are the people that God is supposed to be representing God. These are the ones that are supposed to be um, the, the, the example to the world. These are the ones that God chose, these crazy folks, and God doesn't leave them. And what I love about the book of Genesis is that even though we make mistakes over and over again, it shows that we cannot exhaust the grace and the love of God. And that, my friends, is good news. That's something to smile about. Why? Why? Because, again, remember, we all have issues. As, as cute as you look, as nice as your shoe is, as, as polished as your shoes are, you have issues. Like, no matter how long you've been in the church, you have issues. You, you may be able to hide them well. Some of us can hide our issues better than others. But we all have issues. And the most beautiful thing about it is God is trying to save us in spite of our issues. Notice what the Bible says in Genesis 17. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I am the Lord, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. <laughs> this is crazy. Y'all listen, listen to what God is saying. Walk before me and be blameless. Abraham has showed him for over 30 years that he could not do this. <laughs> Like he repeatedly messed up and threw up and messed up the plan, but God still had faith that Abraham could do what he was calling him to do in spite of the evidence of the opposite. God was still wooing. God was still believing. God still had faith in Abraham when Abraham proved that he was unable to be trusted with the promises of God. This is the type of God that we serve. And notice what God says. It says, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. One of the things I love about God is that God now takes ownership for the promise that he made that Abraham messed up. God says, I know you can't do it, but I'm going to trust you that you are going to trust me. <laughs> you know, this, this is crazy that Abraham repeatedly messed up, but God is saying, I'm going to, be I believe in you so much that you're going to believe in me that together we're going to change the world. You know, one of the things I learned about the story of Abraham is that Abraham had an issue of trying to save himself. In fact, we all do. We, we see it, I, I mean, then I can imagine when, 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 you, when, you, when you have the kids at school, they're, they're always trying to save themselves. Anybody have brothers and sisters? And when mom comes in and asks a question, who did it? It's always, <laughs> like even if they get the whooping and you know you probably should have gotten the whooping, I've never seen a child in over, in four, over four decades say, you know what, mom, dad, don't whoop my brother, whoop me. <laughs> any, any, of your, any of you guys, any of you have been, been that, been that, been that, that, uh, that, that righteous like, now, don't, don't give them the open. Give it, give it to me. And somebody said, no way in the world. What I love about God is that in this journey, God, throughout the story of Abraham, was trying to let Abraham know that you can't save yourself. Every situation that Abraham had, he was trying to do it so that he could take care of himself. Tell Sarah, that, hey, listen, they're about to kill me, but Sarah, tell them you're my sister. They'll take you, but I'll be okay. <laughs> over and over again, and that's the reason why God had to go to such extreme measures to saying, Abraham, take your son and, 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 and take and send his throat. Take him on the mountain and, and, and sacrifice him. He had to go to such extremes until Abraham finally recognized, God, if I'm going to do it, if I'm going to be anything, it's going to be because you are with me and you're going to lead my life. Notice the lesson brings out, however much Abraham's life was a life of faith and obedience, it was not a life of perfect faith and perfect obedience. At times, he displayed weakness in both areas. One of the beautiful things about this is that when we, Abraham talking about the father of the faithful, Abraham was not always faithful, but God was. And if there's anything that we can glean from this particular lesson, it's that God's, the faithfulness is not dependent on us. It's dependent on our relationship with God. And even when we are faithless, God is faithful. 
So God changes their names from Abram and Sarai, which referred to their past, and told them about their future. Abraham and Sarah, which mean, Abraham means father of many nations, and Sarah means the princess for everyone. The basic premise that God was trying to do in the covenant with Abraham was to let him know that I'm going to bless you so that the rest of the world can experience the power of God. And so we see the story of Abraham and Sarah. Sarah eventually got pregnant with her husband's seed. And the Bible says, according to Romans chapter 9 and verse 9, for this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah will have a son. One of the beautiful things about the story of Abraham and Sarah and, and um, God is that God had to constantly remind them that he was strong enough, that he was big enough, he was wise enough, that he could take care of their issues, take care of their problems, and God would be the one that would answer the prayer and fulfill the promise. But the latter half of this lesson, and we don't have a whole lot of time to spend here today, was the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And in this journey that God was doing with Abraham, and after he made him this promise, God went and he was about to destroy, destroy, destroy the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the Bible says when God was about to do this, he came and talked to Abraham, and Abraham took care of him and said, God, please don't destroy the city. And Abraham and, Abraham and God began to barter and to say, hey, God, please, if there's, if there's 100 people, don't destroy it. And God said, I'm still going to destroy it. If there's 50, God is saying, I'll still please, don't destroy it. And, and it got down, they bartered all the way down to 10 people. And there weren't 10 righteous people in the city of Sodom. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 18, verse 22, Then the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom, but Abram stood still before the Lord. Patriarchs and prophets says this, Now the last night of Sodom was approaching. Already the clouds of vengeance cast their shadows over the beloved city, but the men did not perceive it. While angels drew near on their mission of destruction, men were dreaming of prosperity and pleasure. The last day was like every other day that had come and gone. Evening fell upon the scene of loveliness and security. A landscape of unrivaled beauty was bathed in the rays of the declining sun. The coolness of evening tide had called forth the inhabitants of the city, and the pleasure-seeking throngs were passing to and fro, intent upon the enjoyment of the hour. Nobody in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah was preparing that this was going to be their last day. Family, one of the things that God is trying to do, remember we talked about this covenant, was to let people know about the goodness of God. You know, the, one of the biggest challenges about the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is that God had Lot, who was Abraham's nephew in the city. And the Bible says that God was not going to destroy the city if he had 10 righteous people. And the worst, one of the worst things about this story, about God trying to send, um, save these, these individuals, is that Lot did not live a life that let people know he was connected to God. And we find this in several conversations that Abraham, that Lot had with these individuals that were about to destroy a city. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 19 and verse 14 says this, So Lot went out to speak to his sons-in-law who were pledged to marry his daughters. He said, hurry and get out of this place because the Lord is about to destroy the city. But his sons-in-law thought he was joking. And while we re bring this out, there, there was a number of reasons why God was going to destroy the city. But one of the challenging things for me and for the people of God is that when Lot told them about eternal things, they thought he was a joke. That says he did not live his life in such a way that they believed he was connected to a real and active and a coming God. Family, if Christ were coming soon, and he is. And if you were going to talk to the people that you have influence over, and you should, will they believe you? Will they recognize you as an opportunity to, to see this is something to be serious about, or are we living a joke? I thank God for this particular lesson because it allows us to see the faithfulness of God, 
the fact that God loves us and cares for us and do whatever it can to save us, but we also see the judgment of God as well. That in soon and very soon, God is going to come destroy this world so that his children that love him and care for him will be able to live with him forever. Allow our lives to live to live and be lived in such a way that people know that we are candidates for the kingdom of God. God bless you. church family and friends. Welcome to This Week at the OUC. I'm Simone Vaughn. And I'm Isaiah Goodridge. And yes, we are back. We had an entire week off. Certain somebody walked across the stage. You know, yeah, done with school, but now we're here. We're back. And uh, let's get into it. Well, we're glad that you've joined us today for our worship experience. Please tell us where you're joining us from in the chat especially if you're joining us from overseas or if this is your first time watching. We hope that you will be richly blessed by today's service through our preaching, teaching, music, and children's ministry. Today we celebrate Holy Communion. Pastor Deblier Snell will continue his sermon series entitled Get On, Realistic, and our special music will be brought to us by the Aeolians of Oakwood University in what will be Dr. Jason Ferdinand's final Oakwood performance. Pastor Mark Raffel will also share the, his Oaktown Children's Ministry. Please join us in person or invite a friend to tune into the service. Join us at 5.30 p.m. today for our Zoom Sabbath Afterglow program as we review the Sabbath School lesson with Elder Ronald Lang. If you would like to join, please use the meeting ID 248-004-3316 and the password is 4321. Please remember to submit your prayer request by filling out our virtual connect card at OUCSDA.org forward slash connect. For emergency prayer available 24 seven, please call 256-837-1255, extension number 197. Also, please feel free to join our daily prayer call at 6 p.m. On Sundays from 9.30 to 10 a.m., the OUC prayer line will feature Mothers in Prayer, hosted by Hadassah Dalrymple. The prayer line number is 605-475-4120, and the access code number is 848-3381-POUND. The church office is open Monday through Thursday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., and on Friday from 9 a.m. to 12 noon. We ask that you continue to wear a mask and maintain social distancing when visiting the church office. The Oakwood University Church Market, located in the Oakwood University Church Family Life Center, is open Monday through Thursday from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., but will close for lunch from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. It will open from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. on Friday. We invite you to stop by and pick up your vegetarian food products at a very reasonable price as well as your Oaktown merchandise. You can also order your Oaktown gear online at OUCSDA.org forward slash shop. If you love Oaktown, rock the gear. Our Bible 101 study with Dr. Toussaint Williams will meet this Monday, May 16th at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. For the Zoom information, please email info at OUCSDA.org. Top of this corner, our clothing and non-food distribution center is open on Mondays from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. in the OUC Family Life Center. You can drop off items in good condition as well as pick up other items that you may need. For more information, please contact the church office at 256-837-1255, extension number 100. Our next weekly food distribution will take place on Wednesday, May 18th at 11 a.m. in the Family Life Center parking lot. All are welcome to drive through to receive assistance. Our virtual prayer meeting will continue Wednesday, May 18th at 7 p.m. Pastor Snell will continue speaking on the series Get Unrealistic. 
Pastor Rafael and Oaktown will also have a message for our children. You may join us by visiting our YouTube and Facebook media platforms. Young adults, you're invited to join us for our weekly Friday Young Adult Zoom Bible Study at 8 p.m. If you would like to join, please use the meeting ID 948-6252-9844 and the passcode is 707-877. We also have a Young Adult Prayer Warrior Prayer and Pray Zoom meeting every Sunday at 6 p.m. The meeting ID is 917-9395-2065 and the passcode is 144000. Teenage girls from the 9th to 12th grade, join us every third Friday of the month from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. in room 109 of the Family Life Center for The Real. This meeting is sponsored by the OEC Adventist Youth Ministries and The Attic. You can also attend via Zoom. The meeting ID is 822-604. 89620 and the passcode is 489320. The Oakwood University Chemistry Department's HBCU undergraduate program will host its annual 2022 virtual summer bridge program starting July 5th through the 19th. It's designed to increase the quality and the quantity of underrepresented minority students completing their baccalaureate degrees in science, technology, engineering, and mathematic fields. Students may apply at the link found below. And the deadline for students to submit all documentation is May 20th, 2022. If you have any questions, you may contact Mrs. Jackson at 256-726-7112 or sjackson at oakwood.edu. As we continue to experience grief and loss in our families and our church, the OUC Grief Support Ministry will meet virtually on the second and fourth Sundays of each month. For more information, email griefsupport at OUCSDA.org. Next Sabbath, May 21st, we will begin in-person children's Sabbath school for ages infant to 11 years old. Infants to three years old will meet in the beginner Sabbath school classroom in the church. Children's ages 4 to 11 will meet in the OUC Family Life Center, classrooms 107 and 108. However, you must register your children first. To register, visit www.oucsda.org forward slash Oaktown and then click the in-person Sabbath School registration link. Please remember the families who have lost loved ones during this week. We also want to remember those who are sick and shut in in our church family. Please keep them in your prayers, send them an encouraging card, or give them a telephone call to check on them. And we've reached the end of This Week at the OUC. If there are any other church events that you would like to have mentioned in this announcement segment, please feel free to email us at info at OUCSDA.org. Also, please remember to stay connected with us by visiting our website at OUCSDA.org or by following our social media platforms to know what is happening at our church. And if you want to subscribe to our weekly newsletter, you can scan the QR code on your screen or go to tinyurl.com forward slash OUC newsletter. May God continue to bless you and have a happy Sabbath. Good morning and happy Sabbath to you. Good morning, happy Sabbath. It's good to happy see Sabbath Pastor Goodrich. You. <laughs> it's been a little while. It has. Been a you had some a, a wonderful celebration last week. Yes. Good cause for being I, absent. I am so thankful. I'm so yes. grateful. The Lord is good. Amen. And now the next phase of His life. Chapter uh, two. Yeah, yeah. God has something wonderful. I'm sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Congratulations. Absolutely. Thank you. And Thank we're so you. happy to have everyone today joining us to celebrate the Sabbath and to celebrate worship here at the Oakwood University Church. We're glad that you're here for our 
celebration today. Absolutely. Absolutely. We have missed you. I know we, that you've been uh, with us during our prayer meetings, mm -hmm. but uh, we missed you last Sabbath yes. in terms of worshiping here yes. at the Oakwood University Church. It's a reunion of sorts. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but we do want to take some time because I know we have a full day today, yes, Linda, and we'll get indeed. to that in a little bit. But we do want to time, uh, take the time to wish some happy birthdays. Uh, in, uh, and, and we're going to try to cover some that we missed last week because yes. we weren't here. Yes. So Emmanuel Nkosi, happy birthday to you. Mildred Johnson, Dr. Mildred Johnson, happy birthday to you. Roy Hall, uh, Dr. Leon Lewis, happy birthday. Also, we have some Oaktown uh, kids oh, um, that uh, we want to celebrate. Yes. Um, Ella. And um, Aaliyah, we want to say happy birthday happy to you. Birthday. Uh, Vincent Anderson, uh, Dr. Vincent Anderson, happy birthday. Uh, Joe Daly, happy birthday Amen. to you. Happy and Keisha, Keisha Fortson, happy birthday. Her birthday was last Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. We hope you enjoyed it. And we also want to wish uh, a few other birthday uh, greetings. Robert Nichols, happy mm -hmm. birthday to you. Happy birthday to Jerry Banfield. And also Cara Polite, little Cara. Yes. Happy birthday, growing up beautifully. <laughs> Alice Morton, we want to say happy birthday to you. To Anna Ware, happy birthday. Mm -hmm. To Willie Dean Champagne, 13, uh, happy birthday. Yeah. And also <laughs> another Oaktown, another Oaktown yeah. birthday greeting. Carly Wallace, seven years old, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. And today, because we, we have to uh, uh, give a special shout out to our Sabbath Indeed. birthdays. Dr. Gwen Watkins Foster, Amen. happy birthday to you. A musical and genius. Also, yes, yes, and also another Oaktown um, uh, 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 kid, uh, Omega T. Her birthday is today, and happy celebrating birthday. eight years. So happy, happy birthday! Happy birthday! And of course, we'll be recognizing anniversaries next week. But if mm -hmm. you have an anniversary greeting or a birthday greeting that you would like to share that we may have missed, please just drop your name or the individual's name in the chat so that the Oakwood University Church community will be able to celebrate with you and mm -hmm. acknowledge those wonderful days. Amen. So, Linda, something special is happening next week. Indeed. Um, in, in terms of our kids. Parents are going to be so talk, happy. Yeah, there, there they are. <laughs> so next week, we begin our in-person children's Sabbath school. Amen. So, uh, but now, now, a couple of things, though. Number one, you need to register. Parents, please register your children. And you can, if you are here in the sanctuary today, you can do so after the service by going to the Oaktown Welcome Booth and registering directly with Pastor Rafael. Or if you are um, watching, but you're still planning to have your kids come out uh, in person next week, then you can go to our website, OUCSDA.org forward slash Oaktown, and then click on the in-person Sabbath school registration link. Okay? Amen. So you have to register. And then uh, we want you to bring your children at 10 a.m., starting next week because they have to check in everybody has to check in so please bring your children at 10 a.m next week and i'm sure parents are so happy uh, <laughs> sabbath school is such a wonderful part of growing up for for children in the church and yes so we're happy that you'll be able to bring your children once again to fellowship with other kids and, and enjoy learning about jesus absolutely and so because uh, we want our children here at 10 a.m we're going to actually begin um, our adult Sabbath school at 10.15. So those of you who are watching online, uh, you, 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 uh, we're, we're going to start our worship service a little bit earlier. So our Sabbath school will begin at 10.15. And then we'll have our worship service beginning at 11. And, of course, the Oaktown booth is located in the foyer of the Oakwood, Oakwood University Church. So we invite you to stop by to register. Well, today is Communion Sabbath. Amen. I am so Amen. thrilled. Communion Amen. is a wonderful time to reconnect with that thing called grace. Yes. And yes. so today we'll be having communion service here at the Oakwood University mm -hmm. Church in person. And uh, I, I think of grace as when you have a meal that's really good sometimes mm -hmm. and in the 
the middle of that meal, you stop and say, oh, this is so good. Lord, thank you for this food. Yes. That's what communion is. Yes. You're stopping once again to say, God, I thank you. I'm saying grace all over yes. again. Yes. Because God has given us his grace. But mm -hmm. when we do communion, we have the opportunity to be reminded of that grace Amen. and salvation. Amen. Amen. So um, I think Pastor Snell is, is about to uh, share some instructions in terms of those of us who are in-house uh, in terms of how we're going to do the, the foot washing mm -hmm. uh, part of communion. And he'll probably give a little bit of overview in terms of the importance of, of communion. Um, but for those of you who are watching, uh, we will have a mini concert uh, while we in person, uh, you know, go through, are the, going through the ordinance of humility. Of humility. Uh, we'll be having a concert and you'll want to stay and enjoy that. Absolutely. And we'll see you again right after our service. So at this time, we're going to go to Pastor... Deadly ass now. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. That was someone. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. This is the day that the Lord has made. I don't know about you, but I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. And one of the reasons, saints, I'm so excited today is because it is a communion Sabbath. Can you say amen? And one of the reasons we celebrate communion is so that we can take some dedicated time to reflect and recall what Jesus did for us at the cross in the past and how it, it, it secures our eternal salvation going forward. And so what we want to do is I want to first just say a word of welcome to those who are watching online, as well as those who are in the building with us today. If we have anybody who's visiting with us here at the Oakwood University Church for the very first time, would you just raise your hand so we can acknowledge you today? Maybe you're visiting from out of town. Maybe you're visiting from across town. This is your first time. Just raise your hand. I see a number of hands in the back. Let's put our hands together. And for anybody who is visiting with us for the very first time online, just share with us your name in the chat and where you're visiting us from, and those in the chat will receive you warmly as well. Just a few quick announcements that we want to share with you, and then we're going to give you some instructions for the Ordinance of Humility. Uh, sadly, we want to make many of us aware that our dear sister Irene Chester passed away earlier this week. Uh, she is the mother of Sister Brenda Williams. We're asking that you would keep that family lifted up in your prayers, and we want to make you aware that her funeral service will be tomorrow at 1 o'clock p.m. here at the Oakwood University Church. And as was mentioned, we just want to emphasize that on next week, we're going to begin our in-person children's Sabbath school. Now, there is one amendment to what was announced in this week at the OUC. Uh, that group of kids that's zero to three, that class won't begin until the month of June. But if you have a little one, a child or a grandchild between the age of four and 11, there's a special program pa uh, planned by Pastor Raphael and the Oaktown crew. They're going to be over in the uh, uh, Family Life Center in classrooms 107, 108. It's going to be a great time. So we want to encourage you to make sure that you parents are here at 10 a.m. Their program is going to begin right at 10.15 a.m. And so you'll need to make sure that you can get in place, register, have them ready so that they can absorb everything that is a part of the Children's Sabbath School program. And then for those who are adults, there is going to be an adult Sabbath School lesson uh, brought to you right here in the sanctuary commencing at 10.15 a.m. Also, we want you to know, saints, that even though we're in communion and we are kind of past our graduation season, we're going to continue in our teaching series entitled Un Get Unrealistic. We're going to be meeting each Wednesday and each Sabbath as we continue to grow the faith of the body of Christ. And we'll continue this as we go right into our camp meeting season. Lastly, I just want to make you aware of a very special thing that is happening for one of our members, uh, Dr. Jason Ferdinand. Just want to make you aware that um, as he is transitioning, many individuals, not just within the body of Christ, but outside of the body of Christ, are rec recognizing the excellence of his work. So we want to make you aware, church family, those in the building and those who are online, that this Wednesday in Montgomery at 7 p.m., Dr. Ferdinand is going to be receiving the Governor's Award for the Arts, which is going to be presented to him by uh, the Honorable Kate Ivey, Governor of the State of Alabama. And so we want to just recognize him and we rejoice with him 
as he's going to be recognized this Wednesday coming. And so in the Praise Cafe at the end of service, some more information will be given as to how you can secure tickets if you decide to go down to Montgomery and be a part of that. And then we want you to know that um, tomorrow here in Huntsville, uh, many of us have been paying attention as the amphitheater over in Mid-City is finalized, uh, finished its completion. And what's going to happen is the Oakwood University Aeolians are going to be performing tomorrow afternoon at 7 p.m. as a part of the grand opening. So let's give our Oakwood University Aeolians who are here with us post-graduation. They're going to be ministering to us in song today as well. And so friends of mine, as we stated earlier, it is a communion Sabbath. And so one of the primary components of the communion service is the ordinance of humility, where we mimic the act that, of service that Jesus did for his disciples when he poured a basin of water, wrapped himself with a towel, and did a servant's job in washing their feet. So we want those of you who are in the building to know that we have set up the ordinance of humility here on the church grounds. And so what we wanted to do in order to limit the spread or the gathering of individuals who are not coming from the same house, we want you to know that what we've set up first is a couples or family foot washing service. That's going to take place in the gymnasium of the Family Life Center. So if you're here with your spouse, your children, everyone who's come from the same house, we want to direct you to go over to the gymnasium in the Family Life Center. And if you are here as an unmarried woman or maybe you're a woman who came here by yourself, the females communion or foot washing service will be set up in the multi-purpose room here when you go out the exit doors over to the left over in the multi-purpose room and then if you're an unmarried man if you're here by yourself there is a section in the multi-purpose room that has been set up for you as well now if you are part of our online audience or if you decide not to participate in the ordinance of humility we want you to know that there's going to be a wonderful mini concert for those who are watching online it's going to be led out by our Oakwood University Aeolians our praise team and one or two other guests and so what we want to do at this time is we want to begin the process of dismissing I want to invite all of those who are married or are part of families you're here in the same household we want to invite you to go ahead and stand at this time we want you to begin exiting and heading to the family life center gymnasium where you will begin to participate in that service that has been set up for families or couples or groups and so we want to invite you to begin exiting at this time. And then any ladies who are unmarried or maybe you attended church by yourself today, we want to invite you to go ahead and be dismissed as well. You can actually go right out of this side entrance here or here, and you can go right across the way to the multi-purpose room. Or if you go out the main entrance doors, you can go to your left as well. And then lastly, we're going to invite any unmarried men or any men who came to church service by yourself today. You can also begin exiting out of our main entrance doors, going over to the left to our multi-purpose room where you can partake in the ordinance of humility as well. God bless you. Those of you who are watching online, we invite you to stay with us as we're blessed in song with a powerful uplifting blood themed mini concert that is going to be led out by our Oakwood University Aeolians. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Welcome to the worship experience of the Oakwood University Church. Located on the campus of Oakwood University in Huntsville, Alabama and the home of the Breath of Life Television Ministries. Experience worship where Christ is first. Lives are transformed. And sharing God's love flows freely. Welcome to the Oakwood University Church Worship Experience.
yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, yes, I got a song, I got a song, yes, I got a song, they can sing, God gave me a song, angels can sing, oh, I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, yes, Lord, I got a song, I got a song, yes, I got a song, they can sing, God gave me a song, angels can sing, oh, I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, yes, Lord, you don't believe I've been redeemed, just follow me down to the Jordan stream. Jordan River, chilly and cold, well, it chilled my body, but not my soul. I got a song, I got a song, yes, I got a song, they can sing, God gave me a song, angels can sing, oh, I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, yeah, you know, I am redeemed, yes, what's with the price, oh, yes, the blood has changed my whole life, if anybody asks you just who I am, just tell them that I am redeemed. Good Lordy, I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Good Lordy, I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Good Lordy, I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. I am redeemed. Oh yes, I am redeemed. I am redeemed. Oh yes, I am redeemed. I am redeemed. Oh yes, I am redeemed. I am redeemed. I am redeemed. Oh yes, I am redeemed. I am redeemed. I am redeemed. not of works, nor tell of good deeds, for not have I done to merit his grace. All glory and praise shall rest upon So willing to die in my place, I will glory in the cross, in the cross, lest his suffering. Oh, 
all be in vain. I will weep no more for the cross that Jesus bore, but I will glory in the cross. My trophies, my crowns, my robe stained with sin, to us all that are As we come into this communion time, we think about the blood, we think about the sacrifice that Jesus made for us on the cross. And we just think about his holiness, we think about his goodness. And all we can say sometimes is it's a quick hallelujah. How many of y'all got a quick hallelujah in your body this morning? For the Lord God Almighty who reigns up on high. And I know that you know it, so I ask that you sing with us. Let's take it there, Holly. Hallelujah. 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 For the Lord. For the Lord God Almighty. Let's sing it one more time. Holly. Hallelujah. 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 For the Lord. Let's take it out right there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, let's worship on that say He's holy. Holy. You are holy. Yo, 
I know that we know it at this point, so we can sing that a little bit stronger together. All together, say hallelujah. For the Lord, one more time, say hallelujah. Worship him, hallelujah. For the Lord. Come on, let's bring it out there. Hallelujah. Let's call on his name. Say holy. Jesus, you're holy. Are you Lord? Top there. One quick good time. Hallelujah. hallelujah. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. For the Lord. We bless his name. Say hallelujah. One more time. Hallelujah. For the Lord, come on, let's give one last time. Holly, we worship and say holy. Come on, let's magnify him this morning. that together say draw me close to you
you say that I'm your friend? Desire him this morning, say you are. You are my desire. We looked all over, but no one else will do. No one else will do. And no one else can take your place, Jesus. No one else can take your place. We want to feel the warmth of your embrace. Find my way.
bask in his presence the Lord is here he's moving the Lord is moving the Lord is moving he's in this atmosphere Take that straight from the top. There is a fountain. Sinner that's plunged beneath that flood. Say, lose all their guilt. Worship together. 
Essa ilusão Let us stand for the invocation, please. Loving Father, we thank you so much for life. And we thank you for the opportunities that life presents us. Especially we thank you for this opportunity of worship. We thank you for the opportunity of worship on this special Sabbath when we remember and commemorate the supreme sacrifice that you gave to save us from the penalty of sin. And now, Lord, we ask that the Holy Spirit, which dwells within us, will help us worship you in sincerity and in truth. Lord, please let our worship be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. Is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Remain standing. Let us remain standing as we enter into worship. We worship the name of the Lord. We call him the bread of heaven who was sent down from glory. We came to worship him this morning. How many of y'all came to bless the name of the Lord? Give him some glory. Come on, when we look back over, when we see the type of year that we've had, when we see how everything is moving, we're just so grateful to know that we have Jesus, Jesus, the manger born king who died and who came back to rescue each and every one of us this morning. The song is real simple and you can sing it with us as well. It says, bread of heaven, you sent down from glory, many things you were on earth, a holy king, a carpenter, but you are the living word. Sing that with me, say. You were sent down from glory. Sent down from glory. Many things you were on earth. Many things you were on earth. A holy king, a carpenter. Come on, you are the living you word. The living Say bread of heaven. Bread of heaven. You sent down from glory. Sent down from glory. Come on, say many things you were. Many things you were. Awesome ruler, awesome ruler, awesome ruler. You're the gentle redeemer this morning. Come on, say God with us. God with us, and what a friend we have Come on, let's sing it out right there. Three parts. Say Jesus, 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 Jesus. That's what we call. That's what
ask me how my Savior lives, He lives within my soul. simple song that asks six simple questions and hopefully the answer to all those questions is a resounding yes so keep track of those questions as we sing there's power power wonder working power in the blood here comes question number one would you be free
somebody still believes that there's power in the blood. We come this morning because we believe that God still heal, hears and answers. It's been two years since we've been together like this. Two full years. And in spite of all the difficulties and calamities and challenges and even losses, we can still declare that God is good. We stand today excited. Several members we have not seen in a while want to say collectively welcome back. This time, we have an opportunity to cast our cares on him. Because the Bible still says that he cares for us. We want to lift up Brother Kelly Johnson, who's recovering very well from the medical mishap. We praise God that he's still getting stronger. We want to lift up Brother Joseph Champion, Brother Leroy Hampton, Sister Myrtle Dublin and Marie Desermay. We want to continue to keep them in prayer. Also, special prayer for Sister Nanny Joyner. Come every Sabbath and sit right there in the second row. Sister Joyner and her family need our prayers. Also, want to keep in prayer the Rice family. Some of you know George and Maxine Rice. Brother George lost his mother, and they are both in Ohio, Toledo, Ohio. Today, keep the Rice family in prayer. Also, tomorrow in this very sanctuary, we are going to funeralize Sister Irene Chester, the mother of Sister Brenda Williams, tomorrow at 1 p.m. You know, every now and again, you got to be reminded that this world is just temporary. The Bible says the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. So today, in spite of the loss, in spite of the challenge, and in spite of the pain, as we sing our prayer song and as Dr. Taylor comes and leads us in prayer, we're talking to a God who knows exactly what we need, who knows how to win every battle. And one day soon, family, he's coming again to take us home. ourselves to prayer as we sing the song all together it says I will be with you It's prayer time. This is our time to come boldly to the throne of grace. 
So let us assume our position of prayer as we petition the Lord in faith. Our dear, most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to say thank you. Lord, we want to thank you for your mercy and your grace. And Lord, we just thank you for the sacrifice that you made for us on Calvary's cross. Lord, we understand it was over two years ago that we had communion together. And Lord, I personally said bye to some of our members of this church expecting to see them again. And in these two years since we've seen each other face to face during this pandemic, we've lost some loved ones. Some loved ones that we said, I'll see you next time. But they're not here with us for this communion. But Lord, it's still your mercy and your grace that although we said from a human standpoint, I'll see you next time, we know that we'll see each other when you call us from the grave. And we want to thank you for that. But Lord, for those who, have sti who still have breath in their bodies, we're travailing on this earth and Satan is hitting us financially, family, health, whatever he can hit us with, Lord. But you told us in John 14, 1, let not our hearts be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me. So Lord, we are waiting expectantly for you to do what you said you're going to do because your promises are sure. So Lord, as I stand here pleading and in petition, I know, Lord, you're going to take every single prayer and the Spirit will take it before your throne and change the words to what we need because what we need is you, Lord. So every single person under the sound of my voice who are, who's, who's on the airways and listening, I ask that you give us all a special token of your blessing. And as we go through this communion service, Lord, understanding that it is level at the cross, you shed your blood for every single person on this earth. And we thank you. So Lord, as we end this prayer, whatever we're going through, we still want to say thank you. Whatever we have been through, we want to say thank you. And whatever we have to go through in the future, we still want to say thank you. Because your hedge of protection is about us, Lord. And we thank you. So Lord, keep us and save us when you come. In your name we do pray. Amen. Come on, let's sing that straight out there. Together say, I am that I that I You will only trust me. tithe and offering time. Amen? Amen. The New International Version of Psalms 37, 3 through 6 reads, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. 
Take delight in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him, and He will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the sun. Today, I want to just briefly talk to you about joyful surrender, delightful surrender, happy surrender. The dictionary says that surrender means to cease resistance to an enemy or an opponent and to submit to their authority. Now, on the surface, it sounds like, you know, the words joyful and surrender, you know, delight and surrender, happy and surrender, that those two concepts, they just, they cannot be together in the same sentence, right? Well, let me share with you something that happens in my home very often. Um, so every night when I come home from work, you know, uh, first thing I do is I, 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 I greet my wife. She greets me. We begin to share with each other the, the, the day's events, and we, we kind of take care of each other, and we support one another. But then immediately after that, I make a beeline to Emery, our daughter. And when I get there, and, and the fathers in here will know what I mean, you know, the happiness that she expresses when she sees me come in the room, you know, daddy, daddy, it's, it's like it's fresh every single day, right? But what happens after that is what I want you to hear. Some of the first words that she will say to me, this happens maybe two, three times a month. She says, tickle me, daddy, tickle me, tickle me, daddy, tickle me, tickle me. And now when she says that, I, I begin to play this cat and mouse game where I say, you know, oh, babe, I just, you know what, I don't feel like tickling you right now. I'm just, daddy's tired. I really don't feel like it, you know, just let me have a little rest. I'm tired, right? And just as I can see the gloom kind of come over her face, just as I can see that she is believing that I just, you know, I just don't want to tickle her is when I surprise her, I jump on the bed and I begin to tickle her with every passion that I have. I tickle her and she's giggling. I tickle her and she's laughing. Her laughing turns to screaming and she's just, she's so overwhelmingly laughing that it seems like she just can't take any more. And just when it seems like she cannot take any more, just when it seems like she has had all that she can take, I say in this fatherly, you know, kind of stern voice, Emery, now do you, do you surrender? Do you surrender? And she then says, and get this, she then says with a joyful voice, with a happy tone, with a delight in her voice, she raises her arms and she says, yes, daddy, I surrender. I surrender. Amen. Now, the scientist in me, you know, the doctor in me says she's surrendering for one reason, right? She can't breathe. <laughs> she's, she's laughing so hard she cannot breathe. But the priest in me, you know, the, the shepherd in me says that She's surrendering for some other very important reasons. Number one, she's surrendering because she trusts me. She trusts that her father knows just how much, how, how much, how much good, how much bad, how much anything that she can bear in that moment, right? And number two, this is really important. She's surrendering because she believes with her whole heart that, that 
based on the love, based on the joy, based on the happiness and the trust that she feels right there in that moment with me, that what's on the other side of that surrender, it must be even better than what she's experiencing right now, amen? She believes in a childlike way that I have and that I am willing to give her the desires of her heart. So joy and surrender, happiness and surrender, delight and surrender, they can coexist as the deacons prepare to lift the morning's tithe and offering. I have a question for all of you and for everyone that is listening to this even online. The question is, have you been joyfully surrendering your finances to God? When you examine your heart carefully, have you been taking delight? Have you been happy in returning a faithful tithe and offering? If you have, God bless you. God bless you. But if you haven't, if you haven't, then let me share with you once again the challenge and the promises of Psalms 37 again. Trust in the Lord and do good. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Amen. Shall we pray? Father God in heaven, Lord, we are just so, we're so grateful, Lord. We are so happy and so joyful, Lord, to be able to give back just this small portion, Lord. It's such a small portion of what you have given to us. Lord, we praise you. We love you for it. Now, Father, bless the tithes and offerings that are being collected. Help them to go toward expediting your work, Lord, so that we can see your face again, your long-awaited face. We love you, Father, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. world that's constantly changing, it's a blessing and a comfort to know that God is still in control and that he is still touching the lives of people everywhere. Here at the Oakwood University Church, we are committed to reaching all people with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and responding to the needs in our community and beyond. We work diligently to ensure that you are blessed through our preaching, teaching, music, children's, youth, and community ministries. We praise God that we have been able to provide weekly food giveaways, COVID-19 testing and vaccinations, help during disasters, healthy food alternatives through our Oakwood University Church Market, our online support through Grief Share and Divorce Care Ministries, and daily prayer through our prayer ministry, just to name a few. But there is so much more that God is calling us to do, and we need your help. As people return to worship in person, with your prayers and support, we can continue to create additional online content to reach people with the good news and cover the production costs associated with providing a quality, meaningful, virtual worship experience. Please know that you can faithfully return your tithe and combined budget offerings in several ways. You can give in person by visiting our church office on Mondays through Thursdays from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. and on Fridays from 9 a.m. to 12 noon. Or you can mail your gifts to the church at 5500 Adventist Boulevard, Northwest, Huntsville, Alabama, 35896. You can share your gifts online through our church website at www.oucsda.org forward slash donate. Or you can cash app us by utilizing our cash app handle, dollar sign OUCSDA. 
You can also use the Adventist Giving app and donate under Oakwood University Church. May God continue to bless you as we engage in meaningful, relevant, and life-changing ministry. Hi kids, in-person Sabbath school for kids ages four through 11 begins next Sabbath at 10 a.m. May 21st. And for children ages zero to three starts on June 11th so we can prepare our best for them. And I'm so excited. News break, news break. Oh, I don't know why you started off Oak Town Live like that. No kid welcome, uh, no song. Well, that's because I'm getting ready for our Sabbath school relaunch. And I wanna focus on this announcement. Besides, I don't see your new spot ready either. Uh, that's because I'm getting ready to meet the kids next week at 10 o'clock. Uh, and take some pictures with them, selfies. Uh, and I don't know if they know this or not, but it's only gonna be for 10 minutes. Why is that? Uh, I'm a scientist. I've got things to do. In fact, I have to go right now. Bye. That was sudden. But anyway, kids, please ask your parents to register you today after church service at the Oaktown Welcome Center. News break, news break. Parents, uh, I don't know if you know this or not, uh, but this registration is different than when you went online to OUCSDA.org slash Oaktown uh, to register. Uh, this registration is with our Kid Check system that we're going to be using. That's right. Kids, please ask your parents to register you today after church service at the Oaktown Welcome Center with our Kid Check system. And parents of children, infant to three years old, please register your children too, even though they won't start until June 11th. Well, I don't know why they should register now. Here's why. Because the first 50 parents who register their children by after church today through KitChat will be eligible for a $50 gift card because we believe Sabbath school is that important and more. And Kid Check will help us be organized to keep our children having fun, learning about Jesus, and to keep them secure and safe. And parents who already registered your children through Kid Check this week, you will be part of those 50 parents who will be eligible for a $50 gift card. Um, Pastor Bell, uh, I, I want to get in on this too. Uh, I could use the money. I, I mean, I too believe Sabbath school is important. Do you have any kids to register, Brother IDK? Uh, through kitchen? Uh, no, uh, but I'm a kid. I I'm a child of God. Well, kids and parents, this announcement is very important because if you wait till next week to register through KitChat, depending on the lines, your child may miss some or all of the Sabbath school program, and we don't want that to happen. Uh, I hate to interrupt, uh, but I beg to differ with that idea that some kids may miss out uh, if they don't register before next Sabbath. Uh, if their parents are scientists like me, uh, they'll be able to register the same day, the same moment. Uh, they could be split. Uh, scientists are fast like that. Oh, uh, we all I hate to cut you off, but parents, please don't wait until Sabbath morning to register your children. We have planned a wonderful program for our children, and we don't want any children to miss some or all of it. Well, that's all for now. See you directly after church at the Old Town Welcome Center to register your children through KidCheck for our May 21st, 10 a.m. Sabbath School Relaunch for children ages 4 to 11. Zero to three, remember, will be June 11. And remember, Old Town is indeed the place to be.
If you've got a few reasons to rejoice, why don't you put your hands together and give Jesus praise today. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. And let's, uh, let's just put our hands together for the Aeolians, their ministry and song. Thank you so much, choir, for blessing us and warming our hearts to be able to receive the word of the living God today. And as we get ready to go into the word, I just want to take a moment and say thank you to each and every one of our deacons, our ushers, our greeters, our elders, our pastoral staff, our Sabbath school security, our media team, everybody that allowed this communion service to take place. Can you give them a warm amen? They stayed out late. They came in early to make sure that we could rightly honor remember and reflect upon the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We're very excited today to have our first communion in over two years. Can you say amen? We're grateful for what Jesus Christ has done and we want to honor God in our worship today. Now again, I just want to just say one, one additional thing before we go into the word today. Uh, we want to remind you that on next Sabbath, and it was emphasized many times, we we're, going to get, we're going to begin our in-person kids ministry uh, Sabbath school. Can you say amen? And so we just want to remind all of our parents here and those who are at home, you want to be here by 10 o'clock a.m. so that once our program begins, the kids will already be in place. And then the other thing I just want to share, as we had our ministry fair, we had a number of individuals that signed up for various ministries. But I want to just let some who, who maybe have the gift of working with kids know that, that Oaktown needs your support, needs your gifts. And so after the end of service where we are normally, our kids are doing their lessons, if you have that interest in working with kids and helping our kids grow spiritually, please see Pastor Raphael uh, so that we can continue to make deposits to our, to our children. If that's all right, let me hear you say amen. At this time, I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet as we make our unrealistic covenant with one another and with the Lord. Uh, do I still have two or three unrealistic saints left in the church? Amen. Amen and amen. We want to make our covenant. Let's declare it out loud today. Today, I recognize that my faith is greater than my reality. I refute the ordinary because I was created for the extraordinary. I will not allow what I see to determine what I believe. What I believe will determine what I see. I will pray unrealistic prayers, embrace unrealistic vision, begin unrealistic pursuits, and maintain unrealistic expectations. I will live by faith and not feelings. I will live by faith and not facts. I will live by faith and not common sense. Faith won't allow me to be realistic, afraid, comfortable, or limited. I am proud to say that I am unapologetically unrealistic. Give your neighbor a little fist bump and say, uh, stay unrealistic. Turn to the other neighbor, give him a fist bump, say, get unreal, get unreal, get unreal. Amen, amen. Today we're going to turn in our Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, and we're going to begin together here at verse 47. If you're glad to be in the house of the Lord, say amen. I want you to know, I don't even believe you. If you're glad to be in the house of the Lord, say amen right now. Amen. I want y'all to know right now, I feel like we unequally yoked. I'm excited about being in the house of the Lord. I, I need to find some partners that are yoked together in enthusiasm about what Jesus has done. Is that all right? 
Amen. Luke chapter 22, and we'll begin together at verse number 47. When you get there, just say, Pastor, I'm here. Luke chapter 22 and verse 47, and we'll be a little bit more brief than normal today as we share. Luke 22 and verse 47. The Bible says, And while he yet spake, behold the multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? When they which were about him saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. When you read John's version, the Bible lets us know that it was Peter that did the swinging and the servant's name was Malchus. Then the Bible says here in verse 51, And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said unto the chief priests and to the captains of the temple and the elders which were come to him, Be ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves. When I was with you daily in the temple, you stretched forth no hands against me, but this, I, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. But I just want to emphasize verse 51. But Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far and he touched his ear and he healed him today saints i want to talk to you under the subject today unrealistic grace and i want to just subtitle this message he destroyed the evidence let's pray father in this little while would you say much you promised that your strength would be perfected in human weakness. And so, Lord, I just want to connect mine to yours, and I pray that your strength would be perfected in my faultiness. So, Lord, would you make your spirit so dense that it smothers every alternative principality? May faith be multiplied in the hearing of the word. Hide me in the shadows of the cross that Jesus alone might be seen, that Christ alone would be heard. And at the end of our time together, may Jesus alone be praised. We ask this in the name of him who is altogether lovely. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Let God's people say together, amen. And amen, you may be seated in the house of the Lord today. Today, saints, there are four brief lessons on faith that we learn from the arrest of Jesus. And the first thing this story teaches us, friends, is the danger of misplaced faith. You see, real faith is not about my wishes. Real faith is centered on God's will. In fact, the only thing worse then unbelief is misplaced belief. You see, when I am believing in one direction and God is moving in a different direction, it creates a dissonance in my faith. And when that happens, the assumption is the reason the belief did not materialize was because I did not have enough belief. But the reason certain things did not materialize was because we attached faith to a wrong belief. In other words, notice, friends, what Jesus predicted would happen to his disciples. He predicted that all of you would become offended because of me. He predicted that when the shepherd would be smitten, that the sheep would scatter. He predicted that all of you would ultimately forsake me. 
But I need you to understand that even though his prediction comes true, the disciples do not leave Jesus because they have no faith. They don't leave Jesus because they are afraid. In fact, the narrative of the disciples forsaking Jesus is not about people who have no belief. It's actually about people that believe the wrong thing. See, the problem is we think that the disciples flee because they are ashamed to stand with Jesus. That's not true. Do you realize, saints, that this moment is actually what the disciples have been waiting for? When Peter told Jesus that I'm willing to go with you to prison or the grave, I need you to get that this is not conjecture. Remember, when Jesus walked the earth, they were always agitating Jesus to lead a military coup against the oppressive government of Rome. And what we read in the text is not a group of men who are afraid. Let's be clear that they are here for this moment. They are standing with sword in hand and they are ready to paint the ground red with blood because they are ready to fight for an earthly kingdom. In fact, friends, there are some who believe that the betrayal of Jesus was not an abandonment of Christ, but he was simply trying to put Jesus in a position where he had no choice except to muse his divine power and understand that there is simply a misapplied belief because they're wanting Jesus to lead an earthly insurrection when God's goal is to save them by a Sunday resurrection. And see, understand that they, they don't flee until Jesus allows himself to be taken. In other words, they don't run because they are afraid for their lives. They are offended by Jesus allowing himself to be handcuffed. They are disappointed that he allows himself to be taken. There is a disdain that he's allowing them to be subdued. In other words, friends of mine, there is an offense about what Jesus is allowing to happen. Let me ask the question, has anyone ever been offended by what God God allows to happen. In other words, you know that God is able to stop it from happening, and yet he allows it to happen anyway. Uh, you can admit it today because the truth is that we have all been offended in our faith by what God has allowed to happen. In other words, where you believed for a healing, but God allowed a funeral. You believed for a proposal, but God allowed a breakup. You believed for a promotion, but God allowed a termination. You believed for children, but God allowed a miscarriage. And let me just say to anybody who is in a place of disappointment, see, the reason we are disappointed is because there are unmet expectations. But sometimes when your belief does not come to pass, it's not because you didn't have enough faith, but sometimes it simply means that your wishes and God's will did not align. But be careful, friends, how you handle your offense because if you're not careful, your offense will lead you out of faith. And the thing I need you to get about faith today, friends, is that faith is not determined to have its own way. In other words, faith will not just believe for a desired outcome, but unrealistic faith can celebrate no matter what the outcome. Let me say it again. You see, baby faith will only trust God for a desired outcome, but when you've got unrealistic faith, you can believe in God no matter what the outcome is. You see, real faith is able to absorb some disappointment and detours along the way because it understands, Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for the good of them that love God and are called according to his purpose. Let me say it this way, that faith is clay and not concrete. 
In other words, faith is amenable. Faith is adaptable. Faith is pliable. In other words, I need somebody to know this about faith, that faith is bifunctional. Okay, okay, let me say it again. Uh, I need to know that real faith is bifunctional. Now, some of y'all are looking at me crazy because you may be familiar with the term bisexual. And understand that a bisexual is simply a person that goes both ways. But how many of us know that we need a bifunctional faith? You, you need to have a faith that goes both ways. Y'all not with me today. In other words, I need a bifunctional faith that can thrive when it goes well, and it can thrive when things go the other way. And, and see, I need us to know that your faith is no good as long as it's homogenous. I've got to have a bifunctional faith that can thrive no matter what the outcome may be. Do you realize that the three Hebrew boys had bifunctional faith? Because they said, our God is able to deliver us, but even if not, we will not worship your gods or bow down to your image. Understand that James had bifunctional faith, for he says, I'll count it all joy when I fall into diverse trials. Understand that Job had bifunctional faith, for he says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. Understand that David had bifunctional faith, for he said, I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Jesus had a bifunctional faith, for he said, Father, take this cup from me, but nevertheless, not my will, but let your will be done. And do I have at least seven folk in the church today who are saying, Lord, give me a faith that goes both ways. Give me a belief that can thrive when it goes well, but I can thrive when it doesn't go well. I want to have a worship that is not based upon the circumstance, but I want to get to a place where I can praise him when it's well, but I can praise him when it doesn't go well because my worship and my faith is bifunctional. Are you hearing me today, saints? And so go back with me, if you don't mind, to the word here in Luke 22 and verse number 49. I need you to see a couple of things in the word before I take my seat. The Bible says here in verse number 49, the Bible says, when they which were about him saw what would follow, they said to the Lord, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite them with the sword? Then the Bible says, and one of them, talking about Peter, smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. You see, the second thing this story teaches us, friends of mine, is that God doesn't fight battles that you start. <laughs> see, see, God fights the battles that he starts. But he doesn't fight the battles that you instigate. Are y'all with me today, church? See, if it, this is where faith can get a little complicated. Do you realize that what we just read is actually a case study in human presumption? And my prayer is that we can see ourselves temporarily in this moment. You see, what we just read is actually a microcosm of the way we interact with God, and it shows why we are so often disappointed and offended at how God did or did not move. Now, remember, I just shared with you that the disciples are not afraid of this moment. They have actually coveted this moment. In other words, they are at a space where they have wanted to be a part of a battle with Jesus where he uses his authority to overthrow the Roman government. So understand that they are here for this moment. They are pumped about this moment. When those guys show up with clubs and staves, these guys stand there strong with swords in their hands. And notice that when they approach Jesus, they begin to ask the question, Question, Lord, do you want us to smite them with the sword? But notice that before Jesus says anything, that your boy Peter then already took a swing. And notice that he swings not based on an expressed command, 
but based upon an anticipated command, based upon an assumed command, based upon a desired command. In other words, Jesus does not express the word yes. Peter acts because he anticipated a yes. And see, I need just to get this, because see, I'm not trying to drag Peter through the mud. Maybe your boy's adrenaline is a little high. Maybe his testosterone is peaking. Maybe he's a little nervous, and he responds to some stimuli in his peripheral vision. Or maybe Peter just did what he came there to do. See, see, I need us to understand that Jesus had to teach his disciples with repetition that my kingdom is not of this world. Remember he said, if my kingdom was of this world, I would fight for it. And what the disciples have not embraced is that Jesus did not come to fight for Israel's flag. He came to make sure that heaven's banner was established. So, so it's crazy because they ask the question, but then they act before they get an answer. They, they act not on an expressed yes, but based on an anticipated yes. And it's amazing, friends of mine, because some of us find ourselves disappointed because sometimes we start swinging based upon an anticipated command when God gives no actual command. And see, let me just say this, friends of mine, this is why in the journey of faith, you've got to manage your desires because when desire overwhelms, your preference will feel like providence. And see, because we really want the house. Okay, y'all brand new today. We assume God wants the house for us because we really want the car. We assume God wants the how car for us because we just really want them. We, we assume that that's what God wants us. You know what Peter assumed in this moment? Peter assumed that if he takes the first swing, Jesus just going to jump in and start fighting. Peter assumes that if I start the fight, Jesus is going to finish the fight. He assumes that if I set it off, that Jesus is going to finish it off. He assumes that if I strike the match, that Jesus is going to burn this sucker to the ground. Y'all hear what I'm saying today? But, but I need you to understand something, that Jesus does not align and give Peter that type of support. In fact, Peter is completely dismayed when Jesus picks up his enemy's ear and reattaches it to his head. He shows compassion on the very man that Peter hates. And the reason Jesus does this is to teach all of us that I'm not fighting the battles that you started. See, I need us to understand, friends of mine, that herein lies the difference between faith and presumption. Because you realize if Jesus tells him to swing, that's faith. But because Jesus is silent, that's presumption. See, presumption is when I jump out there in Jesus' name without any command from Jesus. And see, the worst thing, friends of mine, you can do is move ahead of God. So they asked Jesus, do you want me to start fighting? And Jesus never even replies. But see, the problem is they wanted this fight so bad that they heard Jesus say yes when Jesus didn't say nothing. Am I telling the truth that sometimes you can want something so bad that you'll hear God speaking when God ain't said nothing? Oh, y'all mighty quiet in here today. <laughs> I mean, sometimes you can want them so bad that you'll hear God say, marry, when God ain't said nothing. Sometimes you can want the car so bad that you hear God saying, purchase, when God has been silent. 
that sometimes you can want the job so bad that you'll move to another city when God has not said move. And see, like Peter, when things get hard, what we want Jesus to do is to jump in and fight the battle for us. And God's word to somebody today is that this battle is not mine. This battle belongs to you because I don't fight battles that I didn't start. And see, God is saying to some young person today who's crying out to him over your failing relationship, he's saying, I ain't fighting for a relationship that I didn't authorize. He's saying to somebody drowning in debt that I'm not fighting for a car payment that I didn't tell you to jump into. He's saying, don't get mad at me because I didn't subdue an enemy just because you decided you were going to hate them. And God is saying, I need somebody to get that sometimes we get disappointed in our faith because we start the battle. We're looking for God to back us up. But how many of us know that God only fights the battles that he starts? See, a prime example of this is remember that the children of Israel, they cross over the Jordan River. They take down the city of Jericho. And without the instruction from God, they decide to roll down on a little town called Ai before they heard a word from God. And even though they had overcome Jericho, they were defeated by Ai because God is teaching us that I don't fight battles. That's all start. See, presumption, friends of mine, is simply essentially this, where we do our will in Jesus' name. See, 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 presumption is simply where I attach the name of Jesus to invoke his power over something that he did not command. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? And see, how many of us know, because we get mad, because we say, Lord, you said whatever I ask for in your name is going to be gift forgiven. But we forget what he says in 1 John, where he says, whatever you ask in my name, according to my will, then that's what I'm going to do. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying today, church? And see, I need us to understand that you got to get to a place where you don't move ahead of God's command, but you wait on the command of God. Let, let me say it this way, and I talked about it in the book. I, I remember like one day uh, we were at our house, and uh, me and my youngest son were working downstairs, and my two oldest kids were upstairs playing. And so I told my youngest son to go up to his older siblings and tell them to begin cleaning up their room. Now, I need you to know that my youngest, he's so excited to be able to tell the older two what to do, that he marches up there, and I hear him shout from down stairs Brooke and Jaden start cleaning up your room now now the problem is the older two are not going to recognize the authority of the baby boy and so they mock him and send him back downstairs without any positive response or affirmation and so he comes down and he begins weeping and he says daddy I told them to clean up but they did not do it I said son this time when you go don't just tell them to do it I want you to tell them daddy said to clean up your room. And understand that when they go upstairs the second time, he marches up with some parochial swag up the steps. And when he gets to the top of the steps, he gets a little bass in his voice. And he says, this time, daddy said for you to clean up your room. And then all of a sudden, they begin moving and adjusting their behavior because he this time, he did not ask in his own authority, but he asked in the name of his daddy. And is there anybody that knows that when you come in your own authority, principalities are not going to move, but when you come in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, that doors have to open that things begin to move when you ask in the right name. Are y'all hearing me today, saints? But, but then, so what happens is, over the course of the day, as we are working downstairs, he was like, came down and was like, Daddy, what else do you want me to do? 
And, and so I say, go up again and tell them, Daddy said, do some reading, God. Go back up again and say, Daddy said, do this chore. And so he is loving working beside me because he's used to acting in my name. But then he makes one mistake. The thing got just a little bit too good to him. So, so I told him, it's okay, son, if you go upstairs and watch television. And so the other two were already watching television. And so he walked upstairs. I just said, go watch TV. And I hear him say, Daddy said, give me the remote control so I can watch what I want to watch. Now, this time, the other two, they sniffed this out. And guess what? They come and say, Daddy, did you say? to give him the remote. And see, what happens is I withdraw the authority of my name for a command that I did not send. And see there, we're wondering why certain things we don't get in his name because he withdraws his authority from commands that he did not send us to do. Are you hearing me today, saints? Third thing quickly this teaches us, friends of mine, is it teaches that your pain should never replace your purpose. Now, what I'm going to share quickly is just a general principle for life and happiness. Do you realize that the last miracle that Jesus did before the cross was to pick up a severed ear and reattach it to someone's head? Now, I need you to understand, friends of mine, one of the things you'll notice if you read the scriptures is that Jesus never used his power in aid of himself. That he only used his power to benefit or bless or help others that stood in need of mercy or grace. Are y'all still with me, church? Now, I need y'all to get, like, what makes this impactful is not just that Jesus healed him, but what impresses me is the timing. You remember, friends, he's just come out of the Garden of Gethsemane. He has just finished sweating great drops of blood as he cried out unto the Lord. In other words, he is in a place of his own despair as the weight of his personal passion is crushing all the way down on him. In other words, he's got a group that's come to arrest him. They're about to go and beat him. They're eventually going to crucify him. But the thing I like about Jesus is that even in the midst of his pain, he does not allow his pain to become a substitute for his purpose because in the moment of his passion, he takes some time out to pause and be a blessing to somebody else. Now, I want to say this with some balance because I believe that there are some of us today who are dealing with an appropriate season of grief where it is time for you to be still and allow God to make some deposits in your soul in this season of grief or disappointment. But the thing that I do want to submit to the rest of us is that sometimes the inverse is true. That sometimes when you're in a bad situation, you don't need to just retreat into your pain. You need to retreat into your purpose. In other words, when it's hard, saints, you ought not just become a guardian of your pain. You ought not just be a soldier of your misery. In other words, do not allow a season of difficulty to replace your divine purpose. Are y'all with me today, saints? You see, one of the things that we learn from Jesus is that sometimes you can borrow gladness by giving a little gladness. I know y'all don't want to hear this. See, see, in the midst of his pain, he takes some time to stop the pain of Malchus. In other words, I need you to know that this becomes a part of his pattern throughout the entirety of the cross experience. That in the midst of his suffering, he pauses to heal Malchus. That even as they hurl insults at him, he pauses to pray for their forgiveness. When he's being dragged through the street, he pauses to give John instruction on how to care for his mother. When the two thieves that once insulted him 
when they confess him, he begins to pause and say, this day I say to you that you will be with me in paradise. See, the thing that we learn from Jesus is that when he is in a place of personal pain, he does not forget the purpose for which he has been called. See, sometimes we wonder, how is it that he was able to handle the burden of the cross? The reason he was able to handle his own burden was because he was able to lift the burdens of those that he entered in contact with along the way. And what I'm saying to somebody today is that when you're in a bad situation, don't just sit around and wait for it to get better in order to bless somebody else. How many of us know that if you start blessing somebody else, that the blessings you give away will become like a boomerang? Oh, oh where y'all at? Anybody ever played with a boomerang? That when you throw it away, if you position it at the right angle, it'll come back to you. And what I'm saying, beloved, is that when you make a happiness deposit, what's going to happen is you'll get a happiness return. And see, the problem with the church in our time is we make the mistake to say that when it gets better, Dr. Dent, I'll be a blessing. But the reason you can't have that disposition is how many of us grown folk know that life will never stop hurting. In other words, there ain't going to never be no season where you got all the money you need and everybody likes you and everything's going perfect and ain't no pain in your body. How many of us know that you don't wait till it gets right to serve? You learn how to serve until things get right. Are y'all hearing me today? In other words, friends of mine, I need somebody to understand that some of us got to learn to serve our way out of sickness. See, I need somebody to get that you don't save your way out of poverty. You share your way out of poverty. Oh, y'all, y'all faith is not unrealistic today. That, see, there's somebody who's saying, Pastor, it's bad in my marriage, but I need you to know it won't get better when your needs get fulfilled. It'll get better when you start fulfilling some needs. Is there anybody that understands that marriage works best when we operate like waiters and not customers? Okay. In other words, there's somebody who's saying, Pastor, I'm going to wait till COVID is over in order to find a way to be in ministry. How many of us know COVID ain't going nowhere soon? So you've got to find a creative way to be a blessing to somebody else. And what I'm saying to somebody is that until it gets better, You've got to make it better for somebody else. And that which you give, guess what? God is going to send it back to you. Last thing I like about this before I take my seat. See, this story teaches us that our God is so good. He's so into your salvation. You know what he'll do? He'll destroy the evidence. <laughs> ah, you see, there was a reason that Jesus healed the soldier's ear. <laughs> you realize, saints, that, that at this point, their evidence against Jesus is kind of shaky. And they're looking for a reason to bring charge against the disciples. But at this point, they don't have a good reason to bring a charge against the disciples. So when they move toward Jesus and Peter takes the swing and cuts off the soldier's ear, you realize the Roman soldiers are like, yep. We got them now. In other words, they've got a reason to file assault charges so they can crucify Peter right next to Jesus. Oh, y'all. Do you realize that the ear of Malchus was supposed to be exhibit A in the prosecution against the disciple Peter? They couldn't wait to bring a bleeding Malchus 
into the court to testify that Jesus' disciples are invoking insurrection against the government of Rome. But understand when Jesus picks up the ear and puts it back on the head, what Jesus is doing is he's destroying the evidence. He just shot down witness number one so no charge can be brought against Peter because Jesus got rid of the evidence. See, the reason it's such a great miracle is because this miracle foreshadows justification. See, justification is not where God says you're not guilty. It's simply where you're declared righteous in the face of obvious guilt. See, justification doesn't mean you are falsely accused. It means the accusation is true. It means you did do it. It means your DNA is all over the sin, that the devil got your fingerprints all over it. But when you're justified, it just means that when the devil came to bring an accusation, he had a list of all of your transgressions. But when it got to the courtroom, all of your sins had been covered in the blood of Jesus. So he says, judge, give me a minute. I had some evidence. I had some proof, but I can't find it. Why can't he find it? Because Jesus covered it in his blood. He blotted it out in his righteousness. He sealed the record so that it cannot be found. And how many of us can praise God because you are guilty, you did it. The doubt accusation was true, but you've been justified because Jesus got rid of the proof. Jesus removed the evidence and you received a pardon not because you're good, not because you're deserving, but because His grace is so unrealistic if you're thankful that your case has been thrown out, that the ransom has been paid, that the record has been expunged. Give Jesus a praise. Give Him a praise in this place. See, the reason the accuser has been cast down that accuses them before God day and night is because your record has been expunged. There is no accusation that can be made because all of your sins have been covered and preserved and hidden by the righteousness of Christ and expunged through the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lamb today. I just want to make a brief appeal today because I need you to understand this is why we are saved by grace through faith. You see, there's a reason we have to be saved by grace only through faith. See, see, can I get some real folk to, to agree with me today? That we so wretched. Oh no, I know you got some degrees, but we are so wretched. We are so fallen. We are so faulty. Listen, man, I'm the pastor. There are some days where I look at my own self and I'm just like, Lord, you could have did way better. No, no, I mean real talk. These are conversations that I'm like, Lord, I just don't know why. I don't know what you was thinking, but I'm just thankful like the song says that he saw the best in me. Because you realize that the, we are so messed up, the only way we can see ourselves saved is by faith. How many of us know that if you took your bad deeds and all your good deeds, you realize that no matter how good you are, your bad would always outweigh your good. 
There's some of us that are entangled in some stuff and, and we can't even see ourselves getting the victory. But this is the good news, 1 John 2, 1. I write these things that you do not sin, but if any man sin, glory to God. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And see, this is the thing about salvation. And this is why some of us don't respond like we should. Jesus says, man, if you believe with your heart and if you confess with your mouth and you believe with your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you know what he says? You shall be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever behaved, that whosoever believes shall not perish but have everlasting life. And see, the reason some of us have yet to answer the gospel appeal is because you hear the gospel and it just seems too good to be true. In your mind, you're like, Pastor, what I got to do? I, I, knew I need to stop this and I need to stop this. And I got to go to this. And I got to learn that. No, no, no. Salvation begins with your belief. And see, and this is why unrealistic faith is so critical even to salvation. You realize that you got to have faith just to trust that your sins have been forgiven. Some of us don't even have that level of faith. Why? Because you've been confessing the same sins since 1972. Jesus says, if you confess, I'm faithful in just to forgive and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness, you realize that no matter how heinous, no matter how grievous a sin, you realize that you ain't got to confess it, but one time. Oh. And his grace is so sufficient that not only will he forgive your sin, he says, I will remember it no more. I need somebody to understand that salvation, it does not begin with your behavior. It begins with your belief. And I need you to understand what happens is your behaviors become an outgrowth or they begin to mirror what you believe. There's somebody today online, there's somebody here in the building that needs to make the decision to receive the gift of salvation. The what? The gift. It is not earned. You don't work for it. You receive the gift through faith. And so I just want to make a brief appeal. There's somebody today that needs to say, I'm going all the way with Jesus Christ. There's somebody that needs to say, I want to become a disciple of the Father. And I need you to understand that discipleship begins just like this. It is simply where you say, I believe that I'm a sinner. I recognize that I cannot save myself. I believe in his death, burial, and his resurrection. And I'm going to lay claim to the merits of Jesus. And when I lay claim to the merits of Jesus, guess what he does? Is he gets rid of all the evidence. He throws out all the proof. So no, there is now no more condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Friends of mine, don't make salvation harder than it needs to be. Don't make it about you. Salvation is about what he has done and accomplished on our behalf. So today you're here. You're online. You want to be born again. You want to begin your journey as a disciple of Jesus Christ. A discipleship journey is made official through baptism. And baptism is simply an outward watery symbol of what Jesus is doing in your heart. And today you want to say, I want to be in one of the next baptisms at this church. I want to begin studying the Word so I can get rooted in truth and in belief. And you want to say, I just quickly, I want to be in one of the next baptisms of this church. You realize you don't have to do this, you don't have to do that. It just starts with your belief. If you're here today, wherever you are, man, woman, boy, girl, just do me a favor. If you want to be in one of the next baptisms, just raise your hand wherever you are. One of our workers will come to you. They'll begin the process of getting your information so that you can begin the discipleship journey. If you're watching online, just email us. Excuse me, go to our, our, our website, OUCSDA.org forward slash connect card. Whether you're here in Huntsville or maybe you're watching from afar, you can make that decision known. But today you're here. 
you want to make it up in your mind to be in one of the next baptisms at this church, wherever you are, man, woman, boy, girl, his grace is sufficient. Just raise your hand, begin the journey of discipleship, and I need you to understand that there's nothing wrong with you for admitting you need a Savior. It's something wrong with you when you can't admit you need a Savior. I'll say it until you get tired of hearing me say it. Don't get fooled by none of these suits, shirts, or ties, or degrees in this building. We are all here as witnesses that we needed a Savior. We needed a gift that only Jesus could provide. So today you're here. You want to go all the way saying, I want to be in one of the next baptisms, whether you're a child, a teenager, a young adult, where you want to be baptized. Maybe this is your first time in church, or maybe this is just your first time in a long time. Would you just raise your hand and say, I want to become a disciple of Jesus. Just raise your hand wherever you are, wherever you are. God bless you, little man. I see a hand there in the back. Praise God for you. Let's put our hands together and encourage that young man. Got a little hand in the back. Got another young person right here. If our, if our Bible workers will begin moving right here. Got another young man in the back. All right. If you can just go to them, go to them today. Is there somebody else? Got a young person in there in the back. Young man, there he is right there. Got another young man right here. Is there somebody else? Just keep that hand up high. Keep that hand up high. Would you receive the Lord Jesus? If you're under the balcony, I need you to maybe be, be, be seen. If you're in the mother's room, wherever you are, we're going to close in just a moment. Is there somebody else today? Got another young person over here. God bless you. Praise God for you, young man. Praise God for you. God bless you. That's a good decision. Young man, that's the best decision you will ever, ever make. Is there somebody else today? Listen, you've been wrestling with guilt and unrest and shame. And Jesus is saying, if you believe, I want to throw out the evidence. I want to get rid of the proof. I want to silence the accuser. So if you're here today, don't harden your heart. Don't say later. Don't say tomorrow. Say today. This is the day. You want to begin functioning in a Bible-believing church. We want to walk with you in the discipleship journey. If you're at home, OUCSDA.org forward slash connect card. And if you're in another city or state, we'll get you connected with a good Bible-based church. And, or if you're within a certain range, we'll, we'll, we'll bring you right here and we'll let you become a member of the Oakwood Church family. If you're here today, just raise your hand wherever you are or you can join online. Got another young person right here on this row. God bless you. Listen, this is why Jesus says when we get to heaven, a child is going to lead us in. Because children know if, if it's that easy, I'm in. I'm in. See, when we get grown, we start complicating stuff. The Word says that I believe it. That settles. My last prayer is this. You simply want to get to a place where you're saying, Lord, help me to have enough clarity to know when it's you speaking. You're saying, Lord, I don't want to move ahead of you. I don't want to lag behind you. I, I want to know when it's you so I can act in faith. If that's you today, just raise your hand wherever you are. Amen. We're coming into agreement together today. Father, we thank you for your word, which is a lamp unto our feet, and it is a light unto our path. And so, Father, we ask in a very special way today that you would help us to have unrealistic faith in your unrealistic grace that removes all of the evidence, that silences the voice of the condemner, and it gives access to the free gift of salvation. So Father, our prayer today is that you would grow our faith to a place where it's bifunctional, where, where we can have faith no matter which way the day goes. So if it goes well, we believe, and even if it goes not well, we still believe and have trust in you. And Father, I wanna pray for that person that's in a difficult place today. Lord, give them the strength to not just wait till everything aligns and wait till everything gets well. Help them to begin being a blessing. And Lord, if they begin being a blessing, it'll become a magnet for every blessing they stand in need of. So Lord, would you bless us? Would you keep us? Would you seal us 
would you grow us to a place of unrealistic faith in your unrealistic grace? We pray this in the matchless name of Jesus. Let those who believe say together, amen and amen. chapter verses 26 through 30 and as they were eating Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said take eat this is my body and he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Amen. Amen.
As we prepare to receive the emblems of his broken body and shed blood, those of you who are in the congregation, you will notice that in the racks in front of you, the communion kits have been placed there. And so to avoid uh, having our deacons stand over, or having us share or touch the same instruments, you will be able to receive your communion right there with the communion kit that is right there in front of you. Oh, the blood, redeemed. 
opportunity to participate in this memorial service, the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ, the bread representing his broken body, and the wine, the unfermented juice of the grape, representing his blood shed for us. We look forward to the time which we will share this with him in the kingdom come. We ask that you would send your spirit in a special way for each person in this congregation to receive the blessing that we so much need. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As you open your communion kits, there are two tabs, one on the top that is specific for the bread, which is a symbol of his body. And please exercise caution as you open that second tab, which is specifically for the wine, which symbolizes his blood. And this time we invite you to take the bread. This is my body, which was broken for you. Take it and eat in remembrance of me. And the church said together, Amen. Amen. And this time we will receive the wine, which is a symbol of his precious blood. This is my blood, which was shed for you. Take and drink in remembrance of me. And again, the church said, amen. amen. This time we shouted, hallelujah. hallelujah. Let everybody that's thankful for the blood just put their hands together and give the lamb an applause and a praise in this place. So do me a favor, saints. We're going to celebrate the goodness of the Lord in song. Our praise team is going to lead us in a song of victory and triumph. So go ahead and stand to your feet. 
let us reflect on God's goodness as we sing to the glory of the Lamb today. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing. That will be. Anyone looking forward to that day? Sing the wondrous, sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace in the mansions bright and blessed. He'll prepare for us a place when we Let us then be true, let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just in glory, let's sing it out, oh quit, when we all, when we all. I know we can't stretch across the aisles, but you could probably raise your hand on this last verse. Onward to, onward to the bride before us. Soon his beauty will be old. Soon the pearly gates will open. We shall tread the streets of gold for when we One quick favor. Well, actually, do yourself a favor. Let's boast in the Lord a little bit. Turn to your neighbor real quick. Just give a 30-second testimony about what the cross means to you. Let them share a testimony about what the cross means to them. Just turn to your neighbor really quick. Just share them. This is what the cross means to me. Let them share with you what the cross means to them.
Amen and amen. Do we have a great day in the house of the Lord today? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Listen, friends of mine, as we prepare to close, we want you to know that our ushers are going to be receiving our benevolence offering at the door. This is a special offering. We take up each communion service. This offering goes to help us meet the, no the needs of those who are a little less fortunate. We don't want to just receive a blessing. We want to be a blessing to someone else. And one of the things we encourage you to do each and every communion Sabbath is to not allow the sun to set wherever you have broken relationship in your life whether it's with a sibling, a friend, a fellow church member. Listen, how many of us are grateful that we have received forgiveness? All right, you know what happens when you're really grateful about receiving forgiveness? Is you turn around and you offer forgiveness to somebody who needs it from you. So don't even allow the sun to set. We want to live out the sacrifice by showing grace that have harmed or offended us along the way. So God bless you. Have a fantastic week. Take what God has given you. Share it with somebody else. So I'm going to close with a word of prayer, and we're going to sing Victory is Mine as we leave today. Father in heaven, thank you so much for what our eyes have seen, for what our ears have heard, for most importantly, what our hearts have received. Thank you, Lord, that you've thrown out all of the evidence, and you've silenced the voice of the condemner. So would you bless us and keep us, give us complete victory as we go into a new week. We pray it all in the mighty name of Jesus. Let those that believe say together, amen and amen. Lift your voices as we sing and as we depart today. Come on, let's sing that right from the top right there. We can claim it today. Say victory is mine. Victory is mine. Three parts, victory. Victory is mine. Victory. Victory today.
Amen. Victory today is mine. Amen. I told Satan, get thee behind. <laughs> Victory today is mine. And why is Absolutely. it a victorious day? Because my sins have been forgiven. Amen. My sins have been forgiven. Amen. Listen, Linda, it's, it's been two years since we've been in person. Yes. Having communion all together. Yes. And it was such a blessing. What a blessing. What a relief. A what, what a... Why, why it is felt communion new. so... So um, uh, meaningful to you? It's meaningful to me because it's it's a do-over of mm -hmm. sorts. Mm -hmm. um, every time I experience communion, it, it, it tells me this is what Jesus did for you. He His body was broken. His blood was shed for you so that you would have the remission of your sins and grace and pardon would be given to you. And anytime anybody who's ever been in a situation, maybe you've been in court before with a ticket, a traffic <laughs> oh, no. ticket. Yes. I've been in, in court with traffic tickets when I was going a little faster than my guardian angel. But... Um, <laughs> I, I remember standing in court and feeling fearful of what the outcome would be. Yeah. And the judge at one point said to me, uh, we're going to reduce your sentence. We're going to wipe this out. Mm. Or times when you've been in court and, and the judge threw out your, your case. Those are the experiences that, that tell us in the natural sense yes. what it feels like to be pardoned. Yes. The grace of God is being extended to us through Absolutely. communion in, in the spiritual sense. And that's an even greater blessing. So that's what communion means to me. You're pardoned of your sins. Grace is being applied. The mm -hmm. blood of Jesus is being applied to your life. And you're washed clean. Amen. So amen. 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 <laughs> amen. And it was an interesting communion today, I must say. Uh, the COVID communion. Yes. Um, where we had hand sanitizer given with the water and the, and the paper towels to dry our feet yes. at the ordinance of humility. And then when we had the emblems, uh, the, the broken body of Christ and the, the blood of Christ yes. in a little packet yes. with yes. a little wafer on top, yeah. that was interesting. But you know what, well, we do what we must. Exactly, exactly. I know there may be some old school people, you know. So, uh, uh, confession, I, I really do like the... Uh, the communion bread. Yes. You know, when they actually make it. Yes, um, so do I. I, I, I In fact, I, I used to look for the biggest piece. Oh, no. I, no, Linda. TMI, come on, come on. TMI. Yeah, but, uh, way too much. Oh, that's just, uh, thank you, Jesus. Uh, but, 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 you know. No, but, but I understand. Because of COVID, you have to do mm -hmm. what, you, what you have because to do. Because we want to keep it safe and at the same time provide a blessing. Yes. Amen. So it was a blessing, and we're going to have another blessing now as we have. Yes. So, so we are going interviews. to have. Yeah, we are going to have an interview. And we're going to have to play a little bit of musical chairs. Yes, I'll um, shift this way, and then maybe you can shift. I guess I'll shift that way as well. All okay. right, okay. So, yes, yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll do a little shift. All right, so I'm coming this way, and... For our surprise guest. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Yes, yes. So, for those of you who do not know, and I can't imagine that you don't know, but this is the maestro, Dr. Jason Max Ferdinand. And uh, Doc, w welcome to the Praise Cafe. Thank you so much. Good to be here. This is what it feels uh, like back here. Yeah, 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 yeah. So listen, um, there's so much that we want to say. And I know that, you know, um, uh, we, we only have a little bit of time. But there's a couple of reasons why um, I wanted you to come on to the Praise Cafe. First of all... Um, I know while this is not your last Sabbath here at Oakwood, but we understand the Aeolians, this is their last this Sabbath here. Correct. Um, and, and therefore, um, your last Sabbath directing them as the Aeolians here at the Oakwood yeah. University Church. I didn't think about it like that. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to thank you, first of all, for that. We want to thank you for uh, your ministry as far as the Aeolians are concerned. Um, I am an Aeolian. Yeah. <laughs> So is Linda. Yeah, yeah. But I, I was back with uh, Dr. Ricky Little. Oh, so, oh, oh, oh. Um, but, you know, I, I'm always blessed. And in the chat, you know, every time that you all sing, people are so blessed. There's something about the Aeolian sound. There's something about the Aeolian sound. So we want to thank you for that. But not only have you served as the Aeolian's um, director and director of choral um, uh, studies here at Oakwood University, but you've been the Minister of Music here at the Oakwood University Church. And I marvel at your choices, the nuances, the, 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 the interpretations that you give. So listen, I know that there are a number of individuals who are watching us from all around the world mm -hmm. 
who um, maybe even themselves may be ministers of music or looking to uh, have responsibilities for music. Tell us a little bit, what is the philosophy or the mindset that you approach the um, position and the responsibility of being a minister of music in, in a well, local that's, church? It's a loaded question. Um, the, the, blessing, the blessing of being here at Oakwood is that we have access to so much talent. Mm -hmm. We have the aliens, you have Dynamic Praise, Voice of Triumph, and the choir is based here at the church. And those different groups give us the ability to do so many different types and styles and genres. Mm -hmm. Ideally, in my mind, um, having a great mix has always been the goal. Okay. And, you know, uh, when I came on staff here with Pastor Newborn, mm -hmm. that was always his thing as well, a good mix. Pastor Bird came, and it was the same thing. Bird, let's do gospel. We needed the anthems and the spirituals. And that's right up my alley because I enjoy all the genres. Yes. Now, the challenge at the local church is just that. We don't have access to all the talent. But mm -hmm. I still think, though, intentional effort should be made to try and make a church service cater to all. Yes. So you have so many different people in the pews, and not everyone is going to like three gospel songs back to back to mm -hmm. back. Mm -hmm. As best you can, just try to change it up. So it's, it's been our joy here because literally it's just been you know, scheduling these different types of things. And it's yes. easy here at Oakwood. I get that to some, <laughs> some degree. And we add the orchestra and we have those high days and our pipe organ. I mean, just, you know, Oakwood is spoiled. <laughs> if, I could, if, I could, if I could say that, I mean, we, we, we are just a little bit. But um, it's just been such a joy serving here. and It's been a lot of fun. And I'm, I really miss this place. Amen. Yeah. Well, you're not gone yet. You're I'm not, not gone I'm yet. I'm not gone yet. But. So, so, so there's another aspect. There's a quote that you, um, you know, tell and that you've um, lived by, yeah. and that you share with the Aeolians, which um, maybe speaks to the level of excellence to which you strive and which you function. Yeah. Can you just share that quote and why you yeah. it, it's so meaningful to you? Well, it's meaningful to me because my mentor made me learn it. Um, one day he just said, Jason, don't come back tomorrow and don't know this. So oh, mercy. <laughs> and, um, so I went home. You know, true art is made noble and it's made religious by the mind producing it. For nothing makes the soul so religious and pure than the endeavor to create something perfect. Mm -hmm. For God is perfection, and those who strive after perfection are striving after God. And his point was, perfection is, is hard to get to, mm -hmm. but the, the endeavoring part was the part he wants us, wanted us to always strive to do. And if you could just endeavor to get to that level, then you, you, you probably will end up in an excellent cloud somewhere. <laughs> and, that's, and that's what I strive for. I mean, perfection is hard. I mean, you can never do a whole song and say, man, that was just perfect. Yes. Like something I was yes. always lacking. But the endeavoring is the key, the key word there for me, which I've put into my life and in, in, in you know, art, making art. Well, it, it, we certainly feel it. And every time the aliens sing, um, th th there are elements, to, as you said, you know, everything isn't necessarily perfect. But... Right. Just the, the, the choices, the nuances, the, the diction, the clarity, um, the, the highs, the lows. The, it, it's just... It, and if I could add something, too. Donald it, Lawrence said this to me a couple of years ago. Sometimes it's in the mistakes that we get the blessings. Mm, like sometimes mm. we do our live recording and we're trying to get everything all correct. But yes. sometimes in those innocent mistakes or things we didn't plan is where the blessing really is. And sometimes he tends to leave those in our recording. And I've, I've never forget that. Okay. So sometimes it's not in the perfection and it's just in the mistakes where people see transparency and they see heart and they yes. see message yes. and they hear it. But, and so it's funny you say that because on the last Aeolians recording, mm -hmm. um, there are parts in which I can hear individual voices. Mm -hmm. And um, while you may think, oh, no, you need to have just a blended, yeah, yeah. you know, course, I like yeah. hearing sometimes individual voices and the yeah. nuances of that. Yeah. Yeah. So listen, um, um, uh, just, just as we're preparing to go, there's a couple of things that's happening with you. Um, number one, that you are transitioning from Oakwood and being yeah. the director of choral studies at the University of Maryland. Right. But also, you are being honored uh, this week. Um, yeah. Um, the the in Alabama they are giving you the uh, if I remember correctly the the uh, um, award for arts uh, the governor's award for the arts yes yeah. so congratulations yeah, thank for you so that much. Um, and also the Aeolians are singing tomorrow because there yeah. is a uh, an event 
um, happening in which we have an amphitheater, a new amphitheater that was built yeah. um, that they are opening this weekend. And of all the groups <laughs> and all the entities to represent Huntsville, they have asked the Aeolians of Oakwood yeah. University. Yeah, you know, it's strange. I, I visited the space on Thursday, mm -hmm. you know, it's beautiful. I'm like, all right, go Huntsville. This, this is a real nice uh, open seat, 5,000 seats. I'm thinking, do they really know what they asked? <laughs> asked us to come and open up this thing? It seemed like you want something a little more, but you know, I think they know what we do. So we're looking forward to it, and it'll be a lot of fun. We'll be in jeans and T-shirts. It'll be fun. And um, and the Governor's Award is something that's been delayed for a year. Okay. I knew of it two years ago, but because of COVID, the delayed entire um, process. I have no idea how I was nominated or who or what. I guess when I go it's there, God, when I go there on God. Wednesday, I'll it's see. God. Just really humbled by that and kind of all fortuitous that it's happening, you know, as yes. I make my transition. Yes. So. so before you fully transition and let the aliens go, mm -hmm. I know that you have a number of appointments everywhere. And I know there are a number of people who are watching mm -hmm. who you may be traveling to their area. So uh -huh. if you can just give us a little bit of your itinerary uh, My with itinerary? Well, the, no, with the Aeolians. With the Aeolians. <laughs> Jeez, where are we going? I know we'll be in our southwest region uh, camp meeting in okay. the middle of June. Um, and there's, there are talks about going to some of the other camp meetings, but you know, yeah, those, I, those I, plans are still in okay. process. But okay, because I think there was talk about northeastern um, There was talk of meeting. that and Allegheny West and east and, and uh, uh, Florida, California. So, so I don't have concrete plans. I do know southwest is happening. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, if they wanted to find out in terms of um, yeah, uh, the on the on the school website, Oakwood University website, mm -hmm. I'm sure when all the details come to fruition, we'll put, place it on there on okay. all the Oakwood Aeolian social media pages. We'll have okay. it on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Well, Dr. Ferdinand, we will thank you so much for coming, oh, no uh, for stopping by. We also thank you so much for your service. Uh, please don't forget us. Oh, never, <laughs> never. I'll never forget Oakwood. It's in my, it's in my DNA. Yes, oh. so we, we, we're looking yeah. forward to seeing you, whether it's yeah. alumni weekend or, you know, just, just, just whatever. I'll stop by and I'll, <laughs> sit, I'll sit all the way in the back. <laughs> yeah, please, please bring the Jason Max Ferdinand singers. Oh, man. You. Let, let the, uh, I, maybe I shouldn't say this, but, you know. <laughs> Let, let, oh, let's plan man. to do a concert That'll here at the at, at, at Oakwood. They'll be fun. They're, they will love that. Many of them went through these walls. Absolutely. And, and I've been associated with this place, Cedric Dan. So that'll be that'll be a great reunion. Of Absolutely. Sorts of well, we'll look forward to yes, that. Thank we'll you look so forward much. To that. Hello, everyone. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, Linda. You got it. So we're gonna do a little transition again, and um, we're gonna have bring on. Shift that way. Yes, we're gonna. I'm gonna shift this way, and then all yeah, the way out. <laughs> Versatile in the Lord. Clean, Amen. Tough. That's it. Of course, of course it is. Thank you so much, mm -hmm. Pastor Goodrich. Pa thank you, yes, Pastor yes, yes. Goodrich, All and right. now Pastor Snell. Hey, 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 hey. And I just want to say something as as Jason Max Ferdinand is leaving. One of the things I love so much about him is his mm -hmm. humility. Yep. You know, he's yep. got so much talent and such a gift, and yet he comes humbly to talk about what God has given him. So, yeah. Amen. And we wish him well. But Pastor I think that's Snell, but that's what Christ wants for us to yes. be. Yes. High character and low maintenance. Amen. Um, I think sometimes there's this, this idea that when we're truly gifted, there's just this hubris that comes along with it. But I think when you have an awareness of what God is doing mm. and you have a spiritual sensitivity to it, the, the automatic byproduct is, is humility. Humility. When you understand where your strength comes where from. Where the gift comes yeah. from. Amen. Yeah. Well, today you gave us a message that was so powerful mm -hmm. and Take impactful, down, talking about unrealistic grace. Yes. And I just want to touch on just a couple of key sure. points that yeah. you made because I think that it, it, it bears uh, being examined a little closer. Sure. When you talked about how God removes the evidence, mm -hmm. I was shouting yeah. in this room <laughs> by myself. You said yeah. your DNA was all over the scene, your mm -hmm. fingerprints were at the crime yeah. scene, and yet when you got to court, yeah. there was no evidence. no evidence. Talk to us about how God removes that blight of sin. He said, it is I, even I, who blots out your mm -hmm. transgressions. Yeah. Tell us how that, that happens in the, the spiritual walk. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, so one of the things about it, salvation, it's just so powerful. And we just mess it up because we always feel like we got to <laughs> add some additional things or requirements or standards. And again, you, you don't have to complicate it. Like when we, the day we receive Jesus Christ through faith, mm -hmm. we experience justification. Amen. And it's a very powerful word because see, justification is not saying you did not do it. It is, it is where we stand condemned, 
deserving of death without any justification within ourselves. We're we guilty. cannot commend ourselves to God mm -hmm. at all. But we're, we're justified. What God does is he imputes righteousness mm. to us. And so all of us, all of our righteousness is borrowed. It is transferred. We Amen. cannot produce Amen. righteousness. Amen. It is completely a gift from God. And that is the day we receive Christ. But then God doesn't stop there. He imparts righteousness to us each and every day to cover the, the new stains that we create on a daily, daily, daily basis. Because we have to die daily. And, and I love it, man, because see, God even says, and we talked about it in the book of Isaiah, he says, man, I, for, he says, I, even I am he who blots out thine iniquities. And watch this. He says, for my own sake. Oh, I love that part. I love that part. <laughs> for my own sake, Amen. I will remember them no more. In other words, I need us to understand that God's grace is not something that he just does as a gift to us, but as a gift to himself. Mm. Because you know how it is for your own creation. He is not trying to have a memory or a record of your, your flaws and your the strains and what you have done wrong. It's like a parent. It's like a parent. That's mm. right. You know, you, you see the best in your kids mm. and that's what you want Amen. to behold. So God is not, see, I need us to understand because one of the reasons we mess up is in the whole salvation narrative, we forget the roles. Mm. So like, it's crazy. Like when people think about condemnation and, and guilt and shame, the enemy has done such a masterful job of applying mm. those traits mm. to God. Mm. But like when you look at the roles in first John chapter two and verse one, he says, I write these things that you do not sin. But if we do sin, we have, have an, an advocate. advocate. So so the advocate, the one who stands for us is Jesus. Amen. But in Revelation 12, it says the accuser referring to the dragon and Satan mm. has been cast down. So the one that's railing accusation, guilt, condemnation, saying you can't be saved, you've done too much. That's never the voice of the Holy That's Spirit. That's never the comforter. Mm -hmm. That is never the intercessor. Mm -hmm. So like we got to understand the roles that God is so invested in our salvation. Mm. Listen, he paid too high a price. Let me just look into the camera. Amen. When I this. He paid too high a price for your salvation to try to nitpick you out of the kingdom of Amen. God. Amen. Like he is not trying to figure out ways to keep you out. His investment was so he could get rid of the evidence to figure out a way to get you into the kingdom Amen. of heaven. Amen. And I just need us to understand and operate with this fundamental assumption that when it comes down to salvation, God is for us. He is not against Amen. us. He is on our side. Amen. I sometimes marvel at the fact that people talk about how hard it is to be saved. And yeah. I, I'm one who believes it's hard to be lost. Mm -hmm. Because if you got yeah. all of heaven, Listen. God, the Holy Spirit, yes. all rooting for you. Yes. You have to work yes. to be lost. That's why the wages of sin. Yeah. You is get that, paid for working mm -hmm, hard. Yeah. So why is it so hard for us to accept God's pardon and forgiveness like we experience today through communion? So, yeah. So, so, so give me just a couple minutes to kind of clarify this. Because, see, this is the thing about salvation. And this is why it has to be received by faith. Because it is counterintuitive to the human experience. Mm. Because, see, everything in the human experience is merit-based. Right. So even when you think of from the time you're a child, you enter into kindergarten, and you get good grades based on how well you have performed. Mm -hmm. You're promoted from one grade to the next based on how well you have performed. Mm -hmm. You're remunerated on your job or promoted based on how well you have performed. Mm -hmm. Or even in a lot of your human relationships, like people's connection to you is based on what you do for them. Right. So like everything in the human experience is based upon, uh, it's earned favor. It is mm -hmm. deserved promotion. So, so God comes in with this whole salvation narrative that says, nope, the most precious gift you will ever receive, you don't have to work for it. You don't have to earn it. You, 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 your, your merits don't warrant it. It is a free gift. Oh, and it's received beautiful. by faith. Beautiful. So when I've been striving and working and trying to live up to approval and meet expectations and meet standards my whole life, I'm, I'm given this thing that's a gift. So there's even something in your sinful nature that says, mm, that mm. can't be right. There's something in your nature that says, no, there's got to be more to this. This is why works religion is so powerful mm -hmm. because it operates under the assumption that I've got to add something to. I've got to earn it. I've got to, I've got to do something in addition to believe. And see, what we don't understand, even the, the relationship between roles and works, is that works don't save us. Works authenticate us. They identify us. So remember Jesus said, by your fruit will you be known. Mm -hmm. 
So, so like, you know, a tr uh, fruit does not produce a tree. Fruit identifies a tree. Amen. So, so Amen. like, I, I, if you're Amen. a layman like me, I, I, the only way I know an apple tree <laughs> is when it got apples, apples on it. it. Only way I know That's a pear right. tree is if it got pears Amen. on it. Amen. So that, that fruit does not produce the tree. It identifies Amen. the tree. Amen. So this you is the relationship between beliefs and works. So if I believe, what happens is I, I develop fruit unto righteousness. Praise God. But what the fruit does, the fruit doesn't save me. It just identifies me as belonging to Jesus Praise Christ. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Well, Pastor, as we wrap up, mm -hmm. can you tell us what's in store? What's coming in the next uh, oh, yeah. several weeks? So listen, listen, God, we we're gonna be right Amen. here. We're gonna be right here getting unrealistic each Wednesday, each Sabbath until we go into our camp meeting break. Amen. So I just, you know, even though we, we were not doing our early morning services right now, each Wednesday, each Sabbath, we want you to stay with us um, as we continue in our series, Unrealistic. Uh, we're excited on April, May the 28th, Memorial Day weekend. We'll be hosting uh, the Oakwood Academy graduation baccalaureate service Amen. here. But we're going to be steering those young people in that same direction. So we just want to encourage us to, to make sure you stay, stay with us. And then we just want to encourage you, if what we're doing here at Oakwood and through Breath of Life is being a blessing to you, we ask that you would participate and that you would support us in three ways. One, we ask for your prayers for the church for the pastoral staff, the team of Breath of Life. Number two, uh, we ask that you would spread the word. Listen, listen, if you're at home and this message added any value to your life, if you're on Facebook, hit the share button, uh, uh, tag somebody in it. If you're on YouTube, do me a favor, subscribe so that anytime we're putting something out, you'll get a no notification on your phone or you can copy the link and send it to somebody that's dealing with guilt, shame, condemnation, mm. who feels like they're too far away from God. Then lastly, would you give to Breath of Life? Would you give to Breath of Life? So you right now, if you're online, you can give online. Right after we say the closing prayer, go to breathoflife.tv. Or you can give by mail at Breath of Life at P.O. Box 5960, Huntsville, Alabama 35814. You can give by phone at 256-929-6460. Or right now, saints, it is it is good. It, it is lawful to do good on the on Sabbath. Sabbath you can give on Cash App <laughs> at Dollar Sign Breath of Life uh, TV right now. And again, every dime you give us, it goes right back into the ministry. Allows us to fill up the internet, net streams, and airwaves with the glad tidings of salvation. Or you can text give three B O L T V. Or you can text to one eight eight three six four dot give. Amen. Dot give. And as the pastor said today, don't wait to be blessed. Yeah. To be a blessing. To be a blessing. Be a blessing now. Yes, right. Pastor Snell, thank you so much as yes, always. Thank for you, the, Linda, for the for wonderful your ministry. word. Amen. Yes, Amen. Mm -hmm. And we hope that you've been blessed by today's service. If you have, again, share, and then we'll look forward to seeing you again next time right here. God bless you. God have bless. A good week. See you next week. Bye bye.